We're good to go on the recording? The recording has begun. All right. <clears throat> Item number one, roll call. Good evening. Um, I'm now calling the Tuesday, September 15th, 2020, regular meeting of the Los Altos Hills County Fire District order. The time is 7.07 p.m. Please note that in support of the physical distancing during the local public health emergency in accordance with Governor Newsom's executive order that relaxed Brown Act rules during the public health crisis, we are conducting the VIA meeting via uh, video conferencing. Because we are video conferencing, we will follow a strict protocol for the benefit of the recording. I will indicate when commissioners, staff, and the public will provide comments. If you have called into the meeting and are not using a webcam, please state your name prior to providing your comment for the benefit of the recording. If any, um, if any participant who is presenting during the meeting would like to leave prior to the end of the meeting, please state your name and announce that you are leaving for the benefit of the recording. Please practice considerate video conferencing etiquette by muting your line when you are not speaking and limiting distractive behavior on the camera. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct the roll call. Thank you. Um, commissioners, I will be conducting all roll calls this evening in the same order. Please remember the order so that you are prepared to provide your comment or vote. President Warren. Present. Thank you. Vice President Vaughn. Vice President Vaughn. You got it, Present. thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Tyson? Here. Uh, Commissioner Price? Here. Commissioner Spreen? Here. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kearney? Here. Thank you. All commissioners are present. And uh, for the benefit of the recording, I'm also going to conduct a presenters and staff roll call. Assistant Fire Chief Glass? Present. Thank you. Emergency Services Manager Gluhan. Present. Thank you. General Manager Logan. Present. District Legal Counsel Siegel. Present. Assistant County Counsel um, Coelho. Good evening. Present. Thank you. Uh, Special Project Services Consultant Hendricks. Present. And uh, Technical Services Consultant BB. Present. Thank you. Presenters and staff are all accounted for. Great. Thank you very much. And with that, I also want to note for the record that as Commissioner Kearney is deployed in Oregon um, on wildfire related services and, may, and you know, so his connection, we'll, we'll, we'll see how he does on the connection. So thank you, Terry, for making the effort after that long day. All right, so we'll move to item two. Um, public comments, persons wishing to address the district on any subject, whether or not on the agenda, may do so now. Please note, however, the district is not able to undertake extended discussion or action tonight on items not on the agenda. Items may be referred to staff for appropriate action, which may include placement on the next available agenda. Please note that while the district board will hear comments upon items which are on the agenda at this time, the district will not act on any such items until the item is under consideration by the district. District policy is to limit public testimony to three minutes per speaker. Do we have any public comments on items um, on items or not um, items on the agenda or not on the agenda? Do we have any public comments at this time? All right, hearing none, we'll now move to item three, which is the president's remarks. Um, so with that, um, I want to introduce a, um, first of all, is County Supervisor Simidian online with us yet? I did not see him. So uh, County Supervisor Simidian is, is scheduled to attend. We'll see if he um, is able to attend. The other person um, I'd like to welcome is uh, Rob um, Coelho, uh, who is with the County Legal Council, who will now be playing in a, uh, moving forward to be playing an important role um, in the staff operations. Um, yeah, so I wanna welcome um, Rob. I also want to recognize uh, Jean Elverson, who's online, who was with us for many years as our district clerk. Uh, good to see you, Jean. Um, so overall, um, here we are tonight, um, mid-September, and everyone in you know here is painfully aware 
that we find ourselves in the height of fire season. Um, you know, we, we have been fortunate that, that the district has not been directly impacted uh, as of yet. Um, but that is, you know, through good fortune, I think, um, up to this point, you know, I don't think we can become complacent. Uh, as we all saw with the August lightning event, how uh, the district could have been impacted and how fast the situation can deteriorate. So I think that just reiterates the importance of what the, the, the commission does and you know the work the staff is doing to move forward our you know our programs forward thinking um, proactive programs that the district um, has been working on i want to thank the staff for the great work over the last two months since we last met uh, you know we didn't meet in august um, and so the staff has been carrying forward so we'll get a report out on all the activities that have occurred in the last two months so thank you to the staff for for keeping things moving forward we do have a very full agenda for this evening. Um, so at this time, I would if if County Supervisor Semidian is online, I'd like to move item six up in the agenda. Is he just joined? He just joined. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So um, at this time, I would uh, with the. Um, if the rest of the commission approves, I want to move item six up to uh, take care of item six now um, on the agenda. Does anyone object? No. All right. So let's move to item six. Okay, which is the um, I'm move my paper around. Um, item six, which is discussion of. Um, um, Item six, which is Los Angeles Hills County Fire District Management Audit Update. So what we have here is item A, discussion with um, Fifth District Santa Clara County Supervisor Joe Simidian regarding the Board of Supervisors review of the management audit of the Los Angeles Hills County Fire District, including the board um, uh, policy committee process. All right, so Jay, uh, you wanna take the lead on this? Yes, thank you. And thanks for everyone for joining us this evening. With no further uh, remarks, I would just like to invite Supervisor Simidian to share with, it, with us his thoughts and engage in discussion with us. So Supervisor, we're very pleased to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. And I know that you're just coming from another meeting. So hopefully you've been able to take a, a deep breath and now you're on another Zoom conference. So here we are. I, I have indeed. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, happy to be with you. Thank you for making uh, time for this conversation. Uh, I'm going to keep my remarks very brief and then just respond to questions. And if I can ask uh, either you, uh, Jay Logan, or uh, your board president, Mr. Warren, to uh, sort of uh, queue up the questions, uh, I will take them in, uh, or comments, I'll take them in whatever order you direct. Um, I think uh, at the risk of stating the obvious at this point, um, board members and the uh, uh, commission members and the general public know that there are two uh, separate but related uh, things happening that are of significance to the district. Uh, the first is that uh, there has been, of course, a management audit uh, performed by the county's management audit consulting team, the Harvey Rose folks. Uh, that has been a long process. Uh, as you know, the audit was considered at our Finance and Government Operations Committee, FGOC, on which Supervisor Cindy Chavez and Dave Cortese sit. Uh, it is uh, teed up now to come to our Housing, Land Use, Environment, and Transportation Committee uh, on Thursday the 17th, just a couple of days from now, uh, for a discussion and consideration and a possible recommendation by that committee uh, on which I sit with my colleague, Supervisor Mike Wasserman. Uh, these audits, I should uh, stress, are routine. They're part of our county government system. Uh, the Harvey Rose Consultancy has been on contract to the Board of Supervisors uh, for, gosh, at least 30 years that I uh, can recall. Uh, we routinely dispatch the consulting firm to audit various uh, county departments and agencies. Um, they can get a little scratchy sometimes. That's just the nature of it. Very few of us really like someone critiquing our performance, even though we all know we can and would like to do better. Uh, so uh, the first 
uh, review of those audits was at FGOC, Finance and Government Operations Committee. That's the norm. That is the uh, committee through which all audits uh, return. Uh, I asked specifically that since the subject matter of the audit was specifically uh, related to the work of the Housing, Land, Use, Environment, and Transportation Committee that we hear it there as well, and that's what will happen. I should underscore that I think um, we've made great progress in the last few months. Thank you to you all for being part of that progress. Uh, there were seven recommendations uh, that were made by the audit team. Uh, your official position, as I understand it, is that we are at agreement on five and a half, almost six of the uh, items uh, that are before us. The only one where there is a significant difference of opinion at this point is a recommendation from the auditor to uh, suspend the delegation of authority from the county to the board. Uh, and uh, I think uh, you all are making the case, which I think you've made very effectively, that uh, that suspension of delegation would not be called for given the fact that we've gotten a yes on all of the substantive recommendations, the other six items that were identified uh, in the, the audit. I uh, mentioned that there were two different but related items and the second one, uh, which is a subject of I think even greater concern, is um, it, it has become apparent during this process that there is some sentiment on the Board of Supervisors, notably from Supervisors Chavez and uh, Cortese, um, to simply consolidate the existing fire districts, meaning uh, County Fire, Central Fire, and uh, the South County District and the Los Altos Hills uh, County Fire District uh, to create uh, essentially a, consolid a single consolidated district. That raises obvious uh, questions and concerns for uh, you all and the folks that uh, the district serves. Um, I, I say they are separate because uh, quite candidly, I think at one point there were folks that uh, thought that they might use the audit report as a, a pretext, if you will, to pursue uh, consolidation. I think the fact that we have gotten to yes on the audit makes that a less and less plausible path. Uh, and I think that's good news, frankly, because I think then that tees up the conversation for uh, co consolidation uh, as a separate standalone item. Uh, and I think it should be viewed as such. Um, so the timeline on all of this is, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, this coming Thursday, our uh, Housing, Land, Use, Environment, and Transportation Committee will take up both this audit, the uh, one for Los Altos Hills County Fire District, as well as the South County audit, uh, which was a companion audit, if you will, uh, and we'll make recommendations after hearing. Look forward to hearing from you all uh, to the extent you wanna participate uh, at that hearing, and we'll send it off to the full board for uh, consideration of possible action. We expect that that will be on the 6th of October. And I uh, paused and checked myself because occasionally the date got misremembered, but it's Tuesday, the 6th of October. Uh, and at that same time, at that same meeting, we fully expect that there will be a, a proposal from my colleague, Supervisor Chavez and Supervisor Cortese for consolidation. Uh, that is uh, obviously a matter of greater concern, but uh, both of these are on track for uh, arrival at our board on the uh, 5th of October. We are um, scheduled to have, excuse me, 6th of October. There I did it again, I apologize, October 6th. And we are also scheduled to have a full meeting of our Board of Supervisors on the 22nd of September. Not clear to me yet uh, what items uh, that are fire related, if any, will be on that agenda, but we will certainly keep you uh, posted and involved. Why don't I stop there? Uh, I realized I had committed to be brief and I've already uh, exceeded whatever definition of brief we might all bring. So uh, how can I uh, help and uh, questions if any are more than welcome. Well, thank you. I, that, uh, that was uh, very informative. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Smidian. So what I'd like to do here is, is that um, I'll take questions from the commissioners um, about um, for, you know, uh, for the supervisor. And then we'll move on to questions from the public. Um, so we'll start with the commission. Uh, so do we have any questions from commissioners for Supervisor Simidian? Duffy speaking. 
Uh, I'd be curious uh, to ask Supervisor Simidian how uh, he interprets what the town is doing uh, in terms of notifying the public about the consolidation issue. Uh, uh, you know, I think that the town's uh, communications have been helpful. Uh, I am uh, aware of them. They have been uh, professional and courteous in reaching out to our office to let us know uh, what they're up to so that uh, no one is surprised. I, I think um, it can only be helpful, frankly, uh, Commissioner, because I, I'm acutely aware of the fact that for much of my district in the northwest portion of the county, you know, what goes on in San Jose every day is not typically top of mind here at the County mm -hmm. Government Center, the work we do. Um, and uh, so I think anything that the town can do to uh, communicate with uh, our common constituents about what's happening here and how they can participate in a polite, responsive, uh, respectful way, that's all to the good in my view. Yeah. Thank you, Duffy. Anything else, Duffy? No, I'm, that was very good. Thank you, Joe. Janice, any questions? Oh, no, not at this point. And I would right. turn on my Roger. camera, but I don't seem to have the capability of doing that. So it's not that I'm hiding from you all, I, pro <laughs> I promise. Roger, any questions? Uh, no, I'd prefer just to let the, the public have an opportunity to uh, uh, supervisor. All right, let me, let me get through the rest of the commission. Uh, Melvin, any questions? No questions from me at this time. All right. Terry, any questions from Oregon? I take that as a no. And uh, George, anything to follow up? Nothing. Nothing from me. Thank you. All right. All right. With that, uh, I'd like to ask the public if there are any questions from the public. Uh, President Warren, if I could just ask a quick question. Um, would you sure, like uh, three minutes on the timer for public comment? Please. Okay. Please. And it looks like Drew Anderson has her hand raised. Please, let's proceed. Oh, Drew? Yeah, I just had to turn my speaker on. Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm kind of concerned about the consideration of consolidating the district. Uh, my husband, Bob, and I have lived in the town since uh, 1986. And the last 20 or so years, we've been very active in, in volunteer work for the town, primarily in the area of emergency preparation. And uh, the working with the Los Altos Hills County Fire District and, and, uh, and the management of the town, we have an emergency communications TAM committee that we work with. The, the fire district has just been very integral to our community. It's just a kind of a life force that helps us get prepared. We uh seem like we're you know pretty well off up here i'm sure some of us are but the the big issue is is that we're designated as a wildland area and uh i don't know if you remember the paradise story but that was a model prepar prepared community uh and it and then it you know kind of dissipated and uh not that that was part of the reason for its demise but this community really is dependent on the good work that's been done by the fire district for the cert program for the response for the whole community involvement with the water district etc uh and it's just sort of a a passionate piece of our community and none of us would really like to lose it uh it's just part of what identifies our community is you know being together and working together and working for a common cause, which is, you know, protection of our safety and health of the membership of the community. Uh, we appreciate Supervisor uh, Samiti and you attending this meeting and hearing our comments. And, um, Thank you. With that. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. I, I think I've managed to project the, uh, the screen now, finally, uh, with your assistance. So appreciate that. If, I'm now coming through. Great. Thank you. Next question from the public. Sarah, who's queued up? Sarah, you're muted. <laughs> uh, 
there it is. Uh, Neil <laughs> is the next person with his hand up. Neil. All Neil. right, let's uh, reset Neil the Gang. clock for him. Yeah. Thanks, mine will be very quick. Uh, I really just have a question. I have not heard a description yet of what the uh, implications of consolidation would be, especially is, is there any way we can estimate, uh, say on a percentage basis, uh, how much of our budget or our financial reserves might we lose? And let me just check with the president. Is that a question that's directed uh, towards me? I think it is, sir. Yeah, I think the uh, the candid answer is we don't know, and that is, uh, I think, part of what um, has caused uh, concern in the community. It is certainly part of what has given me cause for concern. Uh, the um, the proposal uh, has not yet been formally made or even formally sunshined and surfaced. It has, uh, their, their uh, consolidation uh, could come in many different forms in many different fashions. And, you know, bluntly, I think there, there are questions here about, is this uh, about uh, fire protection? Is it about money? Is it about control? Uh, is it about all of the above. Uh, I think that that remains to be uh, seen. And I, I think um, these are all questions that uh, need to be addressed before it would be responsible to take action. And I, I think it's a very, very complex set of issues. Uh, when you start talking about the fire protection needs countywide in a county of 2 million people with not just our county fire, uh, but also South County and uh, your district, Los Altos Hills uh, County Fire. And then uh, there are nine or 10 other fire uh, fighting uh, uh, entities locally, uh, plus the folks at Cal Fire. Uh, and that's before you get into the questions about uh, organization and funding. So um, uh, lots of good and important questions that um, have yet to be uh, addressed, or let alone answered. All right, thank you. Thank you, Neil. All right, Sarah, next question from the public, please. Uh, we don't have anyone with their hand raised, but um, Dave Stewart has asked, what would Supervisor Simidian recommend the citizens of the fire district do to express their concerns effectively? Well, I think um, uh, two things. I would uh, suggest that you be in touch with our board and committees, uh, both specifically on the 17th in two days from now to express your point of view. And if you're concerned, um, that would be the time uh, to express it. I, uh, you know, I think, uh, and then uh, the meet, the board meeting on October the 6th will be uh, a, a critical date in terms of the larger cons uh, consolidation discussion. Um, uh, you know, I, I remind my constituents often that we have a district system in which, uh, you know, the Los Altos Tills County Fire District has uh, only one supervisor that represents them, and that and I am that supervisor. So, so uh, any action gets taken by three votes, a majority of our five-member board. Uh, that um, and that means that by definition, and this is true across the board that by definition, decisions are gonna be made in significant part by folks who do not represent the affected area. So we have a meeting this uh, Thursday. Uh, I would encourage people to uh, uh, hop on the virtual meeting. Uh, I think your district can share information about how to do that. Certainly my office can. I believe Chris Zanardi from my office is uh, on the call and would be happy to share that information. But um, you know, bluntly put folks, if my colleagues don't hear from you uh, the nature and extent of your concern, then they're going to think there isn't concern. That I mean, they, these are folks who have uh, responsibilities and duties in other parts of the county where they are understandably attentive, just as I am, I hope, uh, attentive to things happening in my district. So they need to hear from you. Uh, and as always, uh, and you know, as you always are, uh, you know, politely and respectfully, uh, with some 
acknowledgement of the fact that we're all in this together as a county and that the district has uh, has a willingness and a commitment going forward to work collaboratively. And I think the district's done a great job in these last few months of communicating that. So thank you again. But, but I do think if you're concerned about uh, the potential for these audits to be used as the pretext for consolidation, uh, you need to speak up now. And uh, I would do that at the meeting on uh, Thursday. Uh, I sit on that committee, as I mentioned, so I'll work hard with the permission of the chair to try and craft a path forward that is um, responsible. Uh, but then when we get to the meeting on the 6th of October, um, it really will be important <coughs> that, uh, there that people hear from you and that they know that you care. Because otherwise, um, you know, it, it, uh, uh, it, it's not readily apparent to folks who don't represent the area. I've heard it loud and clear uh, from uh, folks in the district, but you know, other, other uh, members of the board are not gonna have the benefit of that communication. That was a long-winded answer to say, be in touch and be in touch often. Yeah. It's a good answer, thank you. Great. Thank you. Sir, any other questions queued up? Yeah, I'm gonna queue you up. So we have a question from Alan, followed by a question from Commissioner Tyson, and a question from Bob Hag. So um, Alan, you, you can sound off. Thank you. Supervisor Smidian, thanks so much for attending. I wonder if you could tell us um, what the process will be should the supervisors vote to um, merge, merge the districts. Is this something that will uh, go through the LAFCO system? Will the citizens of Los Altos Hills County Fire District have the opportunity to vote on it? And uh, if so, um, um, if a majority of them vote against it, um, does that prevent the districts from being merged? Well, uh, Mr. Epstein, a really a good and thoughtful question, but the honest answer is we don't know. And I, and I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, we don't know, not I don't know. And the reason I'm saying that is because we haven't seen the proposal yet. And this is one of the things that is, as I said earlier, um, creating you know, considerable anxiety and concern, uh, we uh, will um, have at least some minimum uh, idea of what is to be considered on the 6th of October, uh, the Wednesday before, because that's when the agenda goes out. But unfortunately, that doesn't mean that all of the supporting documents will be attached. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I, I regret to tell you that I've been in meetings where, it, you know, paperwork shows up literally in the midst of the meeting that I would have preferred to see well in advance uh, and that I think the public should have had a chance to see well in advance. So if that happens, I would encourage you to respectfully and politely point that out uh, so that there isn't action on the uh, 6th of October that we think of as precipitous. I think the one uh, piece of the answer that I can give you some certainty about is that you know, one of the things that the board could do if there are three votes is simply um, withdraw the delegation of authority that the board has previously extended to folks in the South County and to your Los Altos Hills County Fire District. Uh, and if they simply uh, withdraw the delegation of authority or revoke the delegation of authority, then de facto, what happens is we've got a, a county district that is um, uh, comprised, as I understand it, of the geographic area in those three venues. Now, that's, that's the sort of simple, rough, uh, blunt instrument that might be used. Uh, and you know, after that, presumably there would be uh, some further discussion. But the part that has made folks uh, understandably nervous is that, uh, you know, at any given time, the uh, supervisors can simply revoke the uh, delegated authority, and uh, all of a sudden that leaves you, for all intents and purposes, uh, without control of your own local district 
Uh, I should further note, and uh, I think some of you may know this, but uh, probably many do not, the delegation of authority to the Los Altos Hills uh, County Fire District over the last 40 years is a more expansive one. Uh, it, it imbues the uh, district uh, commissioners with uh, more authority than the one in South County. So um, the folks in South County are used to having a more limited say, one might uh, put it, uh, whereas in uh, the case of our Los Altos Hills County Fire District, uh, pretty much uh, you know, all of the discretion has been uh, delegated to your commission without, with the exception of the ability to bring litigation. And of course, the Board of Supervisors takes final action on the budget, uh, just as we do with other dependent districts like the library district, for example. May short, ask, shorter, an, shorter answer, sure, please. But the shorter answer is, I think the thing that you can be pretty clear about is that uh, whatever we see in the way of proposals on October the 6th, it is likely to include the revocation of the delegation of authority as sort of the precondition to whatever else follows. My follow-up question, uh, Supervisor Simidian, is if the uh, delegation is revoked, does that permit the money to be used outside of the district? It's my understanding that the answer to that question is yes. But you know, you. we'll, we'll uh, be waiting on County Council uh, to give us the uh, formal answer to that. And I, I candidly, Mr. Representative, I think that's you know, part of what's going on here. People, you know, when, uh, when budgets get tight, uh, people look for other sources of funding, and uh, the fact that your district has been uh, well managed and fiscally prudent and has uh, both a solid tax base but also uh, unspent reserves makes it a, um, a desirable target for those who are looking for funding sources. Thank you. All right, Sarah, next up. Next up, uh, Commissioner Kearney, followed by Bob Hag. You missed me, Sarah. <clears throat> Sorry, I met Commissioner Tyson. <laughs> I'm looking for uh, Commissioner Kearney. He, he bumped off the call and joined again. Sorry. <laughs> many people do confuse us, and, and rightly so. Um, I, I want to join the others in thanking you, Supervisor Simidian, for joining us and, and thanking you for giving us this chilling news uh, ahead of it actually happening so we can at least be better prepared. My, my, I don't have a question, it's more of a comment to the other commissioners as well as the public and just to, to note that the, the town of Los Altos Hills and you know uh, Commissioner Spreen and I are both sit on the city council here. We have it on our agenda for Thursday night uh, as a new business, a resolution, um, uh, a report on the recommended action on the, on the, consol the proposed consolidation and there's a subcommittee of two other city council members. So I don't know what their report it says yet, but just stay tuned since, since um, that's two separate city council members. But it does look like we are addressing a response to this consolidation. And, um, and so we can guess that the town will be certainly in support of our efforts to uh, resist a consolidation. And if I may just respond briefly, I, I, I do, you know, I, I do think if uh, either the town through the council or the district through uh, your uh, board, your commission is, has a position on this, is opposed or then um, I think taking formal action to communicate that uh, is going to be important because uh, otherwise people will say, well, uh, you know, they haven't taken a position. Apparently they don't have a problem with it. So if you've got a position, yeah, I would encourage you that's, to take that's, uh, that's uh, item 6B on our agenda tonight. We're going to take there a formal position. Thank you. Hey, Bob, All you're right. up. Hi, my name is Bob Haig. Can you guys hear me? I am a former fire captain with uh, Santa Clara County uh, Fire District. I was with Los Altos in the uh, merger in 97 and um, I work very closely with the commission 
on uh, things that concern fire protection. We were the first ones to start chipping program. We brought goats in to eat the underbrush. I mean, you've done so many good things. My question is, what brought this on? Why are you doing it? If it works, don't fix it. You were the first ones to address putting the utilities underground because you're worried about all the overhead wires and now look what happened. What's going on, what we've dealt with the last few years. I've been retired 10 years and I'm glad I am. And everything that's going on, they're saying about uh, getting rid of the undergrowth, Los Altos Hills has already done that. And since I've left the fire department and still wanted to help people and became a cowboy, I am involved in the large animal evacuation team for Santa Clara County. I went to Miguelia, I went to uh, Paradise to help rescue horses and saw the devastation there. And I remember when I fought the fire in Lidicote Circle way back when, and how many houses did we lose? 17 with inferior equipment, but we've made a stop because we had good fire prevention. We had good roads in and out. We had good water sources. And we're still addressing those issues today with the things you're doing now with the chirping program. You're the ones taking out the dead trees. So my question is, if it works, if it doesn't need fixing, why are you trying to do away with it? And with this large animal evacuation team, when we met with all the other cities and counties that had horses, Los Altos was the most squared away. Mike Sanders had a program that was way ahead of the rest of us in all the counties. And I represent Gilroy. And he could tell us where every horse was, what they had, how we, uh, West Wind Barns, Fremont Hills Stables, uh, they all had evacuation plans, what they're going to do. I mean, you're so far ahead of the game. And the Los Altos Hills Fire Commission can take credit for that. So my question, if you take away the fire protection district, the town of Los Altos Hills is going to suffer. Bottom line, you've got your act together, things are squared away, and it doesn't make any sense. To, why are we even talking about this? The, uh, and I'm sorry, I didn't get your full name, sir. Bob Haig. Mr. Haig, yes. I'm a former fire captain with Los Altos. I read Got about it. this in the paper and was shocked at the response from the firefighters union and from Cindy Chavez. Her not well, so much, but. Yeah. Um, here's what I would tell you. Um, when you say, why are you doing this? That is a question that is best addressed to the two members of the board who have um, step forward with the uh, potential proposal for consolidation. And um, they are Supervisor Chavez and Cortese, and I wouldn't presume to speak to their motivations. So you have to ask them. Um, the decisions, uh, certainly your, uh, your local uh, commissioners have not uh, proposed uh, this step, uh, nor have I. Um, it is a proposal that has come from uh, Supervisor Chavez and Supervisor uh, Cortez, and uh, they're going to flesh out their proposal, presumably, at the October 6th meeting. Okay. Uh, for, for what it's worth, um, it is not a, pro a proposal I could anticipate supporting. Uh, I, you know, I always tell folks, look, I keep an open mind uh, at every meeting I walk into, but, um, you know, I don't walk into the, to the meeting uh, without some uh, ideas in my head already. And uh, to your point, uh, my, I, the ideas in my head are, um, uh, what the hell are we thinking? Uh, this doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but um, but it, the ultimate call is made by three, let me find a good spot here on the screen, three uh, colleagues. So, um, you know, you either need to change a couple of minds with Supervisor Cortese and Supervisor Chavez, if you're opposed, or you need to uh, make sure that supervisors uh, Ellenberg and Wasserman, the other two members of our board, uh, understand your point of view. I would encourage you to participate uh, by, uh, uh, you know, uh, taking a minute to speak to the committee this Thursday, if your schedule permits, and uh, the full board at the meeting on October the 6th, because I think, you know, candidly, as a former firefighter, uh, your perspectives on this are going to be um, important. And uh, as I said earlier, I think, uh, you know, when you try and figure out what's going on here and what is it 
uh, really a public safety issue or is it about uh, the desire to access uh, funds or is it about uh, who has the responsibility and control of the body? I, I, I probably could have and should have been a little more direct with Mr. Epstein earlier. Look, if, if the delegation of authority is revoked on October the 6th, what happens then is that the Board of Supervisors becomes the uh, fire commission for all three of those districts, essentially. So um, that authority that has currently been delegated to your board uh, returns to the Board of Supervisors. We already sit as the commissioners. Uh, in fact, I have a, uh, you know, a, a, an, a, there's an item on our agenda that identifies that in addition to sitting as the Board of Supervisors, Supervisors, we sit as the board of commissioners for the for the central fire. Uh, right now, we don't serve that function for these two other dependent districts, South County and Los Altos Hills County Fire, because that authority has been delegated. But if the delegation is withdrawn, then what happens is all of a sudden you've got five people, four of whom don't live in or represent the district. You've got five people who are the fire commissioners, quote unquote for Los Altos Hills County Fire District. Hope okay, that clarifies you. a little bit. It does, thank you. Thank you. All right. Sarah, anything else? Uh, I don't have anyone in the queue. So if anyone else would like to speak, please uh, either raise the, the hand function on your screen or oh, speak up okay. now. Yeah, this is Duffy speaking. I'd like to just ask for a little guidance here from uh, Supervisor Simidian. Uh, the, the town actually sent out a wonderful mailer to all of the residents of the town, but they did not send it to the unincorporated area. Uh, I double checked that because that's everything we try to send out, we always include all of the residents that we represent. So would you not uh, think, and maybe we can do that with the other agenda items that we have tonight, that we should now take a more proactive approach and make sure all of our residents that we represent receive a similar notification. What do you think about that? Well, Commissioner, what I think about that is you're throwing me a softball. If the question is, uh, do, I, do I support uh, public engagement and participation? I do. If the question is, do I think it's important for all the affected residents to know uh, what's at stake? I do. Uh, if the uh, question is, uh, can you and should you uh, communicate in a similar fashion uh, as the town has already uh, chosen to use with folks in the uh, district who are not inside the town? I, I would encourage you to do that consistent with whatever advice you get from your uh, legal counsel about what's uh, appropriate and uh, lawful, obviously. But um, I do, uh, I always struggle with the fact that uh, county government is I describe it as the invisible layer of government. Uh, you know, we're down uh, the uh, county. I have a district office in Palo Alto at the county courthouse there, but otherwise, you know, we're down here in San Jose. There are 20,000 plus county employees. We have an $8 billion a year budget. And yet, for the most part, uh, people go happily about their lives, largely unaware of the fact that there is a county government unless they happen to use services. Um, and in this case, uh, I think, as I said, anything you can do to communicate, as long as you've run it by council, I, I, I can only say uh, that it's not only a good thing to do, it's, a, uh, you know, it's the responsible thing to do uh, if you want to make sure that your public has a chance to weigh in with their point of view, whatever it may be, yeah. whether, whether you or I agree with it or disagree with it. Right. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. That's great. Helpful. Okay. Anything else from the public or commissioners? All right. Thank you, Supervisor Simidian. I think if there's nothing else on 6A, what we'll do here is, is that we're going to move to items 6B Mr. and 6C. Mr. President, before you move on, can I yes. just uh, offer one uh, not very subtle closing remark, if I may? Please do. Please. You know, the democratic process, as you all know, rewards those who are engaged and punishes those who are absent. I would strongly encourage you, whatever your point of view, do not be absent from this process. That's uh, my last word on the subject tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. 
And with that, we'll continue to be engaged. We're going to move to item six, um, six B. There are two recommendations for the commissions for approval. We will consider and discuss each recommendation individually. Uh, item six B recommendation, approval of a motion by the Los Altos Hills County Fire District Board of Commissioners to oppose action by the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors to suspend or remove the delegation of authority to the Los Altos Hills County Fire District and to oppose consolidation of the Los Altos Hills County Fire District and to direct the board president to send a letter to the board, um, the County Board of Supervisors stating this action. General Manager Logan, do you have anything to add to this recommendation? Uh, just to comment that the motion 6B addresses the issues that have been discussed by Supervisor Submitian, the discussion by the commissioners and by the public here tonight. I recommend the commissioners approve item 6B. I'd like to make such a motion. Thank you, Thank you George. Do we have a second? That's a second. Great. The item is now open for discussion. Is there any discussion from the commission? Just a quick question. Uh, commissioner? Uh, commissioner. Yeah, Roger. Uh, is there any reason to make these separate resolutions versus having a single one? Uh, I think I, uh, I have no issue with the intent of these. I'm just thinking, is there any, uh, given they are kind of separate but connected issues? I think we've just got a queued up agenda wise, Roger, at this point, we've got 6B, which is you know, send a letter to the, the county, you know, expressing that we oppose such action. And then 6C, which is basically the way to think about 6C, you know, um, is, is that we're, we're asking for guidance and approval by the rest of the commission to expand the ad hoc subcommittees uh, um, charter. Okay. So I think we've got two distinct actions. So let's just do 6B, get it voted on, and then we'll move to 6C and discuss how we want, what we want if we want oh. to increase the charter for the ad hoc committee. My, 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 my question, which is again, purely bureaucratic, yeah. is really in terms of the motion, which addresses both the suspension or revocation of delegation authority and the uh, consolid opposing consolidation in one recommendation. Is there any reason to have those separated? Again, I'm, I'm open to, I have no particular preference on that, but just I just noticed that we've discussed them as separate items and is there a re is it a muddled issue to have them in the same one? Okay, so you're meaning six six within six B opposing delegation opposing uh, revoking of delegation of authority and opposing consolidation two is different there, no's. Yeah, is there any? And this is probably a question for uh, the legal team. Is does this provide any advantage to have separate resolutions uh, opposing these since these will be different discussions in different organizations and different meetings? Again, I have no preference on that. I just wanted to, I was curious about that question. Legal? Dan? You... President Warren, I think that this is a policy decision, uh, whether to do okay. it in one or two is, th they're both perfectly appropriate. And I think it's a decision for the commission, assuming they're approved to determine which they believe will be more impactful. I, I would say, sorry to just butt in here, I think it's more impactful to say an emphatic oppose and lump them together. Okay. 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 Again, I have no uh, standing on this. I was just curious whether there's a legal advantage to either one. Thank you. Any other commissioners have any thoughts, comments? All right. Then I would, uh, is there any public comment on this item? Any public comment? All right, hearing none. We'll now call for a roll call vote. Uh, District Clerk Vargas, please conduct the roll call. Thank you. Um, President Warren? Approve. Vice President Vaughn? Approve. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. Commissioner Spreen? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. And Commissioner Kearney? We might have lost Commissioner Kearney again. Commissioner Kearney? Not available. Not available. <laughs> Not available. Uh, uh, Commissioner Kearney is uh, having problems with his connection. He's texting me. Uh -huh. Is 
he wants to vote yes on this. Is there a way for him to do that if he texts me that or um, would he just be recorded as not voting? He would be re recorded as not present, even though the Brown Act rules have been uh, yeah. loosened. Uh, text voting has not been approved or proxy voting uh, at this time. That's interesting. Is it possible that he is able to vote later in this meeting? Because I do believe it sends a message to say 7-0. Uh, he says that he's muted on our end. Uh, Sarah, could you check and see, see if his connection is muted? It does say that he's muted, but unfortunately all I have is the option to ask him to unmute, which I've done. So yes, I vote yes. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Very good. Yeah, it's on Very your it's on your guys' line. I am, I, yeah, you, I'm unmuted. Okay, great. Excellent. Stay right. aboard. Thank you. So the motion passes seven to zero. Excellent. Okay, thank you. We'll now move to item six C, recommendation: approval of a motion to authorize Los Altos Hills County Fire District Commission ad hoc. A management audit subcommittee to engage with supervisors committee and, and the county in a wider conversation a path forward to ensure public engagement collaboration and a process for discussion of the fire protection district um, uh, of, uh, of fire protection in the district boundaries and within the county general manager logan do you have anything to add to this recommendation yes and thank you mr president i would like to just make a few remarks uh, the Commission Ad Hoc Management Audit Subcommittee was appointed by the Board of Commissioners at its meeting on September 18th, 2019. I thank the subcommittee for their tireless hours and energy to participate in the confidential exit conference, participate in writing the 68-page district response, find a common path moving forward as stated in the post-audit report plan, and to be representatives to speak to the FGOC committee that, and now to prepare for the presentation at the Hewitt committee, followed by then the Board of Supervisors meeting. So we're still in the middle of all this process. The subcommittee will be reporting back to the commission at its public meetings on the progress made. Approval by the Board of Commissioners of this motion renews the authorization of the subcommittee to ensure public engagement, collaboration, and a process for discussion of fire protection in the district boundaries and within the county. So I would recommend approval on item 6C. Thank you. Thank you, General Manager Logan. All right, I will now entertain a motion for item 6C. Juan makes the motion. Thank you, Melvin. Give me a second. Uh, Spring, Spring will second. Thank you, Roger. All right, the item is open for discussion. Is there any discussion from the commissioners on item 6C? Now I wanna add my thanks to uh, this subcommittee, which has put in a lot of hours and I'm sure it was not on their horizon when they took this job, however many years ago. So thank them for the continued work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Thanks, Roger. Terry, did you have a comment? I did not. All right, thank you. Any other, any commissioner, any further commissioner comments? All right, is there any public comment on this item? All right, hearing none, there's no further discussion. We will now vote. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct a roll call vote. Thank you. Uh, President Warren? Yes. Vice President Vaughn? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. Commissioner Spreen? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kearney? Yes. Great, and the motion passes seven to zero. All right, excellent. Okay, so now we're gonna take, and we're gonna go back to item four on the agenda. So item four, which is Santa Clara County Public Health Orders. General Manager Logan, please provide the update. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Just some quick remarks here. Each week, Emergency Services Manager, Fire Captain Gluhan, and Special Project Services Co Consultant Hendricks and I are on a countywide public information conference call for status reports on COVID-19 and roundtable discussions about each agency on wildfires and other emergency conditions in their jurisdiction. 
Captain Gluhan is a public information officer to report for the district. The County Office of Emergency Services and Health Department provides slides and media feeds for public communication. These are utilized on the district website every week and on the district public media channels. We can coordinate these efforts with the Town of Los Altos Hills and the two slides that are presented to you tonight are, are health and uh, COVID uh, slides demonstrate the information available through public media channels. Um, uh, and if you'll notice that this is a new tiering process that the governor is now using, the County of Santa Clara moved from the purple tier to the red tier. And in that they stay for, for three weeks and certain businesses are allowed to open. Uh, next slide, please. On the next slide, there is an active link here that will take you into a, um, a, a set of information as to what, what work areas are open and what the, the restrictions are. So this is just some good information. Encourage everyone to be aware of what's going on in the county with COVID-19. The district does have health and safety as part of its mission uh, to protect, protect residents. So this is an important function for the district. So thank you, end of my report. Thank you, General Manager Logan. Is there any discussion from the commission? All right. Uh, is there any public comment on this item? All right, hearing none, we will now move to item five, pre um, presentation and approval of the draft financial audit report for 2020, 20, fiscal year 2020-21. Item 5A, presentation by Ahmed, um, I'm not going to be able to get his, your, a major last name correct, of uh, Eddie Bailey, financial consultant. Um, Vargas, please introduce the item and explain the financial audit process. Great. Um, thank you, Mark. So, uh, commissioners in your packet, um, you have a draft copy of the uh, financial audit report for the fiscal year just ended, uh, June 30th of 2020. And um, Ahmad uh, from Ide Bailey, who is our auditors. He, I believe, has just logged in um, and will be available to um, just provide a, a brief background and, and um, answer any of your questions. But before I uh, defer to him, I just wanted to uh, point out a couple of um, updates. Um, uh, on page two of the audit, um, one of the page numbers is incorrect. Um, we're going to get that fixed. Um, it, one of the page numbers that cites where to find a graph. Um, so that'll be corrected. On page three, um, in the second bullet, it mentions uh, capital projects. Um, but we're going to change that. Um, so we had no large capital projects. We're going to actually change that to read uh, no large projects and programs expenditures. Um, and then finally on page eight, um, there was a, a typo. Um, we mentioned delayed deferment, um, but the delay should not be there. It should just be deferment of the uh, the fire hydrant water flow projects. So again, just little little fixes there. And of course, I'm I'm open to um, any other suggested changes, um, and I will be passing those on to Ahmad um, before we have the final audit, which will be brought to us for approval at the next meeting in October. So. Right. Um, I would final like final approval in October. Final approval in October. Yeah. So I would just um, I'd like to um, introduce Ahmad from Ide Bailey, and you can tell us all how to pronounce your last name, please. <laughs> <laughs> Evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ahmad Goraibe, and the name of the firm you got it right, Corey. It is Ide Bailey. Um, so this is the annual audit of the fire district. Um, again, the scope of the audit is to ensure that the financial statements are fairly stated. Um, it is a, a process in which we uh, confirm the account balances that are reported on the financial statements. Uh, we take a look at the internal controls. We look at the manner that you process receipts, disbursements, uh, whatever expenses are outgoing or whatever inflows that are incoming, it's a process that we take a look at um, and we look at, you know, common practices that are out there in the industry. And then we come back at final, confirm these numbers, confirm your cash, confirm 
your property taxes, whatever revenues that you have in there, uh, whatever numbers are reported on the balance sheet. And then at the end, uh, we are required to tell you if we noted any audit adjustments. And I'm pleased to let you know that we had no adjustments for the financial statements. Um, we encountered no difficulties in the performance of the audit, and then we noted no deficiencies in the internal controls with respect to the district. Um, the report itself, I mean, the main statements that you will see obviously out there are on page 13 and 15. It may be a little different on your agenda packet, but inside the audit report itself, the page numbers are 13 and 15, which is basically the results of operations for this district. Uh, shows about $12 million, $13 million in revenues, and then it shows um, a balance sheet in there with about $24 million in cash, and that is it for our audit, and I'll be more than happy to take questions. All right. Thank you, for uh, Financial Consultant Vargas and, um, and Ahmad. Are there any clarifying questions from commissioners at this time? Hearing none, any questions from the public? All right, hearing none. All right, um, so what we're gonna do is we, we want a motion to approve the, the draft audit so that we can bring it back for final approval in October. Uh, so I'm now looking, I will now entertain a motion and for this motion for all subsequent motions and you know, the commissioner uh, making the motion um, and the commissioner state uh, seconding the motion, please state your name for the benefit of the recording. Commissioner Spreen uh, moves acceptance of the uh, draft audit. And by the way, I'd like to congratulate Corey because this is really an honor for her that things look good. Yeah, this is Duffy second. Very good. Okay. Um, uh, the item is open for discussion. Is there any further discussion from the commissioners? There are none. Any further discussion from the public on this item? All right. We will now vote. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct a roll call vote. Thank you, Mark. And just uh, for the record, I want to state that um, this is the, um, I don't know if we have to redo the motion, but because there are a couple of changes that I pointed out um, if the motion needs to be clarified that we are approving the draft with the changes, the three changes I outlined. Um, yes, uh, I modify the motion to accept the changes as outlined by Corey previously. Right. And Duffy. Second, of course. Thank you. Any, anything further from the commission? The public? Okay. All right, Corey, let's do, let's vote now. Roll call, okay. Um, President Warren? Yes. Vice President Vaughn? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. Commissioner Spreen? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. And Commissioner Kearney? Yes. Okay, and the motion passes seven to zero. And um, Ahmad got disconnected. Um, so I am back in actually. Oh, you're back, okay. You're back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so I don't All think right. we have anything further, and he, you can uh, dismiss yourself from the call if you'd like, Paramount. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Ahmad. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good night. Thanks. All right. We'll now move to item um, seven, which is the chief's report. Um, at 7A, uh, let's go. Uh, let's start with 7A, which is capital improvements for the Almani Station. Uh, seven. A1, district authorization for installation of flooring. Assistant Chief Glass, please provide your report. And good evening, President and members of the board. I have tonight with us Support Services Manager Dave Snow, who will be doing the presentation uh, for consideration uh, this evening to discuss some of the improvements to the El Monte Fire Station. With that, I'll turn it over to Dave Snow. Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for having me on tonight. Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, if I could just take a moment to sort of introduce myself and our team. Um, many of you in the district are familiar with uh, support services as provided by the uh, County Fire, Central County Fire Department over the years. Um, I came from the County of Santa Clara 
a little bit more than a year ago, and I was running the um, facilities and fleet departments building operations management division. So I, I do have experience with public works and Rob Coelho's on the line. Um, I've called on him before. I'm familiar with working with uh, contracts compliance. And I just wanted to brief the uh, commission on our project approach. Everything that we do is consistent with public works contract law. We look for competitive <coughs> bids and solicitations. We make sure that we're following county contract templates that include provisions for liability insurance, worker compensation insurance, performance bonds, payment bonds, depending on the extent of the project, and of course, warranty provisions. We do have a uh, project team within support services. We have a number of staff that are well seasoned and experienced with both fire station construction as well as general office uh, teams and projects. Next slide, please. So I appreciate the opportunity to sort of come before the commission. I think the goal tonight is to really talk about kind of what we see as some short term needs for the Almani fire station and give this board an opportunity to consider and sort of provide a little bit of direction of what you'd like to see us return back with in the month of October. And so I can tell you that my first priority as support services manager is to take a look at removing carpet from the interior living area of the station. That's consistent with best practices for hazardous material mitigation, any kind of carcinogens that could get tracked into a residential area. The, the Central County Fire Department really practices a healthy in, healthy out. So we wanna take away any kind of risk to firefighters and that really starts with removing carpeting from the living dormitory spaces. And we recommend installing luxury vinyl tile. I'll go through that in a little bit more detail. Obviously the interior is um, due for a, an interior paint job. And then as I was sort of making my rounds through that station, I noticed that it is dated when it comes to the restrooms. Modern firefighting stations typically have gender neutral restroom pods. And what that means, I can explain it better in a later slide, is that instead of having a men's and a women's, a traditional bathroom style, Given that we don't know what the face of firefighting might be in the future, it's important that we recognize diversity of firefighting staff and provide for individuals privacy. And we found it beneficial where possible and where we have um, lack of physical constraints to consider when we do bathroom remodels to create sort of a, a toilet shower sink combination. And it looks to us at an initial glance that El Monte might be able to accommodate three of those pods where there's currently an existing men's and women's uh, shower and restroom. And then uh, a minor point is just considering the wall and I apologize for the typo on item four, office 202 and office 203. And so I'll explain that in a moment. Next slide, please. And so as far as flooring with luxury vinyl tile, I know when I first uh, sort of considered it as a facility manager, I was thinking like, are we talking about a rollout linoleum? No, this is like a, a, it gives a hardwood look with a rubber backing feel. It's extremely durable and it's conducive to be non-porous. So it's easy to maintain, easy to clean. And there's a real good value on that. Right now at the Saratoga fire station, we're moving forward with a, um, plan to remove all of its upstairs carpet, including the elevator, and replace it with the same type of product. And then um, as part of the presentation, I, I just put it out there, there's different shades and hues and colors, and of course, that's all at the board's discretion. Next slide, please. I didn't freeze, right? Oh, there I am. No, you didn't freeze. All right. <laughs> Just checking. It's been a long day of Zoom meetings. I appreciate everyone's patience. So as far as painting, our current paint contractor is Empire Painting. And it's a person that's extremely experienced with fire station interior and exterior projects, particularly with our department. Uh, just last fiscal year, we did an exterior painting of the Monta Vista Fire Station, our county fire headquarters in Los Gatos, and the Campbell Station. This year, fiscal year already, we've scheduled them for the Saratoga Station Interior Painting job. Next slide, please. So restroom renovation, I hope this comes through on everyone's screen, but you can kind of see the layout of the second floor 
of the El Monte station. And what you see is a little bit of overlap of my yellow highlight box into the dormitory area. We feel that if we can compromise possibly one of the dormitories, this would give us the square footage that's necessary to take this and convert it from what's typically underutilized space. Right now, there's a whole set of lockers in the restroom that unfortunately aren't large enough to accommodate today's modern firefighters. And so redoing into a pod situation would put one shower, one toilet, one sink, and we would have three separate pods. As a point of conversation, um, yes, we're always looking to increase diversity of our firefighters. Yes, um, I'm always hoping that we have more female firefighters, uh, but at times this station does not have women firefighters. And so it can be a little awkward because this is our only station with the houses of battalion chief and the residential dormitory that doesn't have a restroom assigned to the battalion chief. And so what typically happens is the station staff sort of take over the men's restroom shower area. The battalion chief takes over the women's and kind of puts a note on the door that, by the way, I'm in here taking a shower because what could happen is women could travel out of the conference room area down the hallway to use a secondary restroom if the toilet next to the conference room was being used. So again, we think it's a, a better idea to create the three pods. Next slide, please. So the wall that's highlighted between Office 202 and Office 203, Office 203 is where the BC conducts daily business. And right now, for reasons unknown to me, I'm sure there were good ideas at the time, you have two doors that sort of open onto another pocket door. So possibly at one time there was a thought for the need to flow through the space. What we're suggesting is to allow a project that would hard wall and remove that pocket door, leaving the two other doorways that opened the hallway. That provides a higher level of privacy and confidentiality for the BC to conduct their business. Next slide, please. So as far as next steps, what we're suggesting to the, for the commission's consideration, and we can come back with more information for a decision at the next meeting, is that for us to take a hard look at the restrooms beyond what we've considered just scratching pencil and paper is to contract with our architect. We do have on-call architectural services approved by the Board of Supervisors. We could write a project agreement at an amount not to exceed $50,000 and they could go through to create the plan, program, and schematic design that also results in the rough order magnitude of cost. It's very likely we wouldn't get close to that $50,000 limit, but it's somewhere probably more than 25, less than 50. At that point, we would return to the commission to say, if you wanna do the restroom pod idea, this is the approximate rough order magnitude of cost. And then the commission would have a chance to approve the project at that point or not. And so if it was all approved and if we move forward, then we would go forward and advertise the projects. We would manage it on behalf of your commission and we would be moving any kind of contractual obligations through our county council and board of supervisors if it came to that amount. We believe that the threshold of this capital project would be less and that the fire chief has delegation of authority to execute and manage the project at our level. The alternative is that we could return to the fire district commission meeting with just an estimate for flooring and paint. And that's a pretty simple process for us. Um, we already have two contractors, one for paint, one for flooring. We would get them to get together and give us a rough order magnitude of cost for you to approve in October. Next slide, please. And so with that, I just wanna tell you that I all appreciate um, the opportunity to come forward and, and speak to you about this. I appreciate your consideration for the station. It means a lot to station staff that work there on a daily basis. And uh, I just wanna let you know that they're well taken care of. There's no huge issues or problems right now. Um, I did talk to them because there were questions about the kitchen and what could be done. We've had some initial conversations with our architect. The constraints of the building, unless you modified your conference room, which I don't think would be on the agenda, uh, the constraints of the building sort of prohibit too much flexibility in the kitchen area. It's possible we could contract for a, a dollar threshold with an architect to take a look. Is there anything that can be done? But right now of 
of the multitude of the 15 stations that I'm in charge of keeping up and running, El Monte's kitchen is certainly not at the top of the priority unless this commission felt otherwise, if you wanted to do anything to modernize. But um, those are kind of what I presented tonight are the, the, the top of mind most pressing issues. And with that, I can answer any questions. All right, any, let's, let's start with questions and then we'll talk about how we wanna move forward. So any questions from commissioners on the proposal here? Uh, Duffy speaking. Okay. May I speak? Please go, go Duffy. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm impressed that they want to make these changes. That sounds really reasonable. However, I'm also curious, didn't we at one point think we needed to do something downstairs in the training room to sort of do some modular construction down there? And shouldn't, if that's a, a potential, shouldn't we, you know, add that to the list here for this project? Any comments from other commissioners that were involved in that discussion previously? Melvin or Jay, do you rec recall anything? Refresh my memory a little bit there for a second, Duffy. Yeah, one, we basically looked at uh, what we had in the training room there with a little small area for a office area for uh, the uh, emergency services manager and uh, then we thought, well, maybe they could have that be a little more circumspect in terms of like making it into something else, you know, another little tiny quadrant or a little whatever they want to call these little rooms that people sleep in or rest in, but any rate, or work in, um, and organize the downstairs, that training room, remodel that in some way. So, Jay, do you remember talking about any of that? Uh, yes, I do, um, very much so. I think I'm just at this point in time with the COVID-19 and, and I know that we shouldn't make plans based upon a, a current condition of public health emergency, but civilians are really not using the station just for health and protection reasons to, to the fire crews. So um, I would hesitate to start that discussion right now but it may be mm -hmm. something that we can talk about with um, Dave Snow and see if there's some possibilities perhaps in the future or if that training room can be converted in some kind of a way. I, I'm not sure that civilian offices right now would fit there if that's what you're referring to. It, it's right. been pretty much a storage and as an area for cert storage and equipment storage. Um, Captain Gluhan's been in it a couple of times, but we have not been into the El Monte station since March 17th, so. Right, I know, it's been like seven months or so, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't start thinking about it, whether we're gonna throw in with this right now, it's gonna, this is gonna happen not overnight, you know, so maybe we should have some discussion going forward, uh, whether we wanted to do it all at once and then postpone doing this for another six months or half a year or whatever. But if I, you know, clearly we're gonna to wanna to do something with that training room down the line. If I could respond to Duffy and still keep cutting off George, who's politely had his hand up, uh, yeah. I would say that I think your comment is correct that we need to discussion of administrative space for our, our staff is a key one. Uh, I think that's a much broader discussion and needn't be tied in with this one, which has a, uh, pretty directed effort already. So I would keep those separate. I don't think that this, I think proceeding on this, if we choose to do so, uh, does not provide, provide any obstacle to us discussing what kind yeah. of administrative resources we need. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm going to agree George, with you, I, I think in, term, in terms of building changes and all the fact they're separate floors means I think we can effectively deal with them separately. Uh, jumping to to the crux of this, my feeling is I'd love for our station and our location to be a premier location. So the things I've heard today sound quite appealing to me. And my, the only question I have for uh, Dave Snow is, is we have this small entry area, uh, which is really wasted space because nobody uses that upstairs entrance. And I, I just don't know, I didn't see, I didn't see any changes to making that an effective office area or other thing useful since we're already up in that area anyway. Have you, has anybody late looked at that space? Um, from Hi. my perspective, people hadn't brought it up to me, but uh, we'd be open to hear 
what the needs are and, and certainly we can take a look because doing the work in Office 202 and 203, you know, that's, it's certainly something we can consider. The only thing I can think of is if there's some ADA reason that we need exactly. to have upstairs entrance. The uh, handicap yeah. parking's up there. Exactly. Yeah, you have to keep that in mind, uh, George. That's true. Thank you for bringing that up. That's exactly why that lobby is there where the handicap parking is located. And we've had to use it a couple of times. So, and yeah. There's no, there's no elevator there either. So, right. Yeah, how about an elevator? I'm all for that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Good. Thank Otherwise, you. it looks uh, good. Any other comments from the commissioners? Okay. So my, uh, so my feeling on this, uh, guys, is, is that a um, couple of things. One, you know, we all are aware we, uh, the commission, uh, the district owns the fire station. The fire station is now uh, 20 years old. It, um, and so we are actually, you know, um, it, you know, due for probably a recapitalization of the fire station. Um, to echo George's comments, um, I, uh, I would like Almani Station to be a very attractive um, fire station for firefighters. Um, I want them to want to go to come to El Monte Station. Um, we need, and you know, one way we can do that is to keep it in great physical condition um, and to do take care of the maintenance, take care of the capitalization aspects to do, and to modernize it and keep it um, first rate. Um, so I would actually encourage um, Dave is, is that just um, as you go through the station, don't limit it to just this. Those other aspects of the station that are either suboptimal in terms of functionality or, you know, have, you know, are worn out and are appropriate for um, revitalization, please bring them to this commission. Um, because I, I feel strongly, I'd like, I want to keep El Monte Station in great shape. I want to attract, you know, great firefighters. I want them to come there. I want it to be a, a clean, safe, healthy place for them to spend, you know, a lot of time. Uh, it's their home when they're not at home. Um, and so, you know, and we have the means to be able to do this. And so please, you know, you've got a proposal here for the bathrooms, the flooring and the, and the wall, uh, but let's just not limit it to that, you know? So in the future, uh, let's, let's continue this conversation about areas that are pain points or frustration or just general um, improvement. Let's, um, let's have, bring them to this commission. So that's my comment. Um, but I think what we need to do here is, is that we need to, we've got a proposal here to, um, for an architectural, uh, to engage an architect for $50,000. Um, and Rob, um, I think we need legal advice here is, is that, that that request to spend that money wasn't on the agenda at this point. So, how do we proceed? Can we can we may have a commissioner make a motion to you know do not to exceed fifty thousand dollars spend, or do we need to actually have a motion brought to the commission to be able to support yeah, that? Motion. Yeah. Mark, so if, go ahead, Rob. Please. If the if the questions uh, directed to me and and Dan may yeah, have please. some specific input tied to historical issues, but. Um, in order to make this fully transparent and make it clear uh, to the public what the possible expenditure of funds may be, I think it's probably best to uh, provide some direction to administration, Jay, um, to come back to the board with a proposal for uh, what uh, to recommend and, and let the board take specific action on that and agendize it as such. Um, that would be my legal recommendation tied to Brown Act disclosures and making sure that you've you've teed up specifically what you'll be voting on, uh, so the public has an opportunity to weigh in to the extent that there's any desire to do so. And Mark, you, I, Rob. I, I certainly can with yeah. that. And that's actually what I understood the proposal uh, from Mr. Snow to be tonight was to tee it up to bring it back for discussion for October. So maybe I misunderstood the proposal that was made tonight, but I do not think a specific ask was made tonight and the specific ask will come back in October with more details. Well, well I will, uh, this is Commissioner Spreen, uh, I will offer my direction that I hope this comes back with all the changes that uh, Mr. Snow has 
put forth. And I would also echo uh, both George and Mark's comments that uh, in this coming month, if you have a chance to look through the station for other places where modernization is needed, I would encourage it and bring that back next month as well. Uh, I would all deal. <laughs> I would also say that the uh, certainly the, the front entrance and its use for ADA compliance is certainly one that I would look at to see if there's a more useful way to make that space work. Uh, but in this preceding month, I would say find. But let's take this opportunity to really make the station what it needs to be. In 20 years, this is the first chance we've really learned or had a chance to say what works and what doesn't work. Let's fix those too. But I certainly uh, strongly agree with all the changes Mr. Snow has put forth. I look forward to seeing those come back to us next month. This is Duffy speaking. May I just add one thing? Can you please, tell me, please, Mr. Duffy. Snow, uh, is it possible uh, that they fix the wall yet outside on the deck? Has that been repaired? I mean, I hate to bring it up, but we've been waiting and waiting for that thing to get done for the several months, if not a year. Did that, uh, Mr. Snow, are you familiar with that issue? Yes, I am, Commissioner. Uh, it, to my knowledge, the job has been completed. There may have been one or two small pieces that the contractor was waiting for, but to my knowledge, it's good to go. That's fabulous, thank you. Big help. <laughs> well, we got hit by a car. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, any other commission comments from the commissioners? Input from the commissioners? Yeah, I have one question. Uh, yeah, so Melvin. Is it possible that, you know, when we look at this, maybe um, it's usual and customary for the BC to have its own dorm enclosed? Uh, maybe if we look at that lobby, as long as we meet that ADA uh, compliance piece of it, that the BC actually has. Uh, his or her own quarters where his his or her dormitory is attached to a restroom and that's what i'm using uh -huh. where you know they basically have their own their own room so that's interesting and, and that that puts things at you know the state of the art uh fire stations we went okay. from dormitory to every um fire each and every fire personnel had their own an individual dormitory and, and that that helped in a lot of things like for instance snoring right and then privacy you know visions and things like that so if we can look at that while we're looking at things and if the space uh, allows it then you know i would i would say look at something like that as well good that's good all right any comments from the public at this time uh, alan has a question yes alan uh, this is Alan Epstein. I'd like to ask a question about the contract between the district and the Central Fire Department. Section 6.2.8 talks about remodeling and expansion. Um, we've had this conversation before. Uh, my interpretation of 6.2.8 is that the fire department is responsible for paying for these things, uh, not that the fire district is responsible for paying. So I'd be interested to hear from the attorneys uh, what their interpretation of section 6.2.8 is. Thank you. Excellent. All right, Rob, your first homework assignment. That's, that's fair enough. I'm happy to look into that. I, I, it sounded like uh, in Dave Snow's presentation that he anticipated that because he was talking about the authority of the, uh, of the uh, chief for the uh, Central Fire District, as well as going to the board if it exceeded a certain amount of authority, which is uh, what the process is for Central Fire District. But I'll look into that issue and, uh, and uh, let you know my legal analysis and response. Thank you. All right, so any further comment from the public? All right, so with that, so Dave, I think your marching orders are you Go do your first, continue your analysis. Work with um, district staff, uh, General Manager Logan, to put bring forward a full proposal for um, agenda and action at the October meeting. That sounds fantastic. And if I could just close with my comments that any type of project that we manage is following the county's public health orders uh, related to COVID for construction practices and activities. Um, currently, we're doing uh, several projects in different fire stations, and all of our contractors are compliant. Um, I would like to say that uh, I appreciate the comments about the ADA accessibility. 
whenever a building uh, undergoes renovations that become improvements, we have to be very careful that we don't trigger modern code requirements over certain thresholds. So we'll be working with the architect to come up and I do look forward to coming back to the board with a full report. Great, thank you Dave. All right, we'll now move to um, item 7B and 7C, which are the, the August 2020 and the September, uh, um, or July 2020 and August 2020 uh, chief report, uh, Fire Chief Glass. Please provide your reports. Yeah, good evening again. Um, thank you again, Dave, for that presentation. Really appreciate you putting that together and uh, look forward to working with you as we move forward to the October meeting. Okay, um, July thankfully was a relatively slow month, uh, no significant events and um, we can go to the next page. Uh, we did have three small incidents, two of them were cooking fires and one was a gas meter that did uh, catch on fire outside of a structure. Uh, which resulted in the combined three incidents, fit approximately $15,000 in fire loss and damage. Uh, we're slightly off our target for year-to-date calls. Uh, you can see at this time last year, 572 for the Los Altos Souls Fire District. We attribute that to the COVID-19 shelter-in-place orders, which is a little bit off our target. As uh, things began to pick back up, you can see month over month, the calls were remain consistent um, at 63. And the month before we were 62 and May was 66. Again, we're seeing uh, relatively depressed numbers due to the COVID and shelter in place orders that were in the county. Uh, the one good and positive thing for that is response times are below the threshold that we're looking for, which is seven minutes, 59 seconds. You can see that we didn't have any late calls during this month. Uh, the pie chart breaks down the total amount of calls um, and by type. Uh, Again, shooting for that 50 to 60% mark for EMS related calls, our service calls, including power lines down, hazardous situations, pick up and put backs, uh, public service assists, uh, picked up 30% of our call volume, and then approximately 8% were fires, and that includes the, the three that were caught in the dollar, dollar loss index. Um, again, the community risk program, that's an auto population uh, that pops in here with all COVID, due to COVID, all of the uh, activities were canceled. So those numbers should all be zeros. Apologize for that. All right, that's July. How we do for August? Okay, uh, this is the map showing where the three incidents were. We'll transition to the August report here shortly. August was a little bit of a different month. Obviously, we had the lightning storm come in on August uh, 16th, created a significant amount of calls for us. You're going to see an uptick in the August calls. Uh, it also uh, started the CZU lightning complex, which uh, indirectly posed a limited threat to the district. I uh, was in brief communication with uh, General Manager Logan, uh, as was Fire Chief Tony Bowden, as, as we began to work with the Sheriff's Office on our evacuation plan uh, and our warning eventually due to the weather conditions that were threatening uh, to push the fire in a north uh, easterly direction towards the district at 35 and Page Mill intersection. So I'll talk a little bit more about, about that after the report, but again, no significant rep uh, responses within the district. Next page. Um, again, still off the mark uh, for the calls, but you can see a definite uptick in August. This uptick is attributed to the lightning event and the windstorm and the power lines down uh, that we saw um, you know, mid to late August. Uh, again, response times look really good. Uh, you can see all of the first duty units were uh, below um, seven minutes, 59 seconds. And see call volume average, again, draw a little bit of decrease um, in EMS calls and you can see the uptick in service calls and that's attributed to the, the lightning and uh, severe weather that we, we faced. Dollar loss value was $3,150. That was due to a kitchen. We had a small uh, cooking fire. It was uh, contained to the cooking vessel. So that means it stayed within the pot and or the stove, but it did damage the cabinets within the structure. So that's where we got the, the dollar loss value there for the fire. And then that'll be shown on the next page on the map. So this fire was actually the one here in Loyola's area, kind of on the uh, south west uh, side of the district. Um, a couple of little things we're going to talk about tonight in addition, oh, any uh, questions on the report, I apologize. Any questions, commissioners? All right, anything from public? All right, Chief Glass, go ahead. 
Okay, um, I was asked briefly to just talk about our Zone Haven product that the um, County of Santa Clara had gone ahead and Santa, Central uh, Fire District secured uh, in advance of a countywide grant. So uh, we did receive funding from the Shush Gap and Uwasi to fund a regional evacuation program uh, called Zone Haven. And I did send a brief one and a half minute video link to um, Sarah, and I'm not sure if that's uh, available to, for us to watch, but that'll give us a really good overview of the product. And we'll begin with the video and then I'll talk a little bit about it. Can everyone see the video? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Oh, there's supposed to be audio with it. Did it die? Just, just died on you, Sarah. Let me just reshare. I think I um, forgot to click the optimization button. Hang on. Let me know if you can't hear it again. <laughs> matter. Fires that move incredibly fast that actually force people to run from their homes have become the new normal in California. The wildfires of the last few years burned so fast and so hot, gathering around a paper map to discuss evacuation plans once a wildfire has already broken out, wastes precious minutes. Wildfires like the Camp Fire highlight the critical need for smart evacuation plans. This isn't a fire that we can fight right here. This is what we we fear in Santa Clara County is a large damaging wind driven fire. It's time to bring emergency evacuations into the modern age. Introducing Zone Haven, a standardized emergency evacuation platform. This is the first platform of its kind. Uh, it's the first to be deployed in the Bay Area. Notifying first responders and San Mateo County residents the moment an evacuation is ordered. And the moment it's called for, dispatch can see it, the public can see it, the first responders are all looking at the same map. When every minute counts. Firefighters want to know how fast and how far the fire is going to travel. Law enforcement wants to know which roads do I need to open up and create one-way or two-way traffic controls. And San Mateo County residents want to know if they need to evacuate, which roads are safe and where to go. Been able to harness the local knowledge in every individual jurisdiction and agency, put it on a platform that everybody's using the same language and, and technology, all with the goal of ensuring that people get out quickly, they get out safely, and they have the exact same information that first responders do in those critical moments. Okay, great, thank you. And you can see that the trailer on that video there says coming uh, summer 2020. So uh, we did receive it in summer of 2020 and it was going through its initial um, draft stages of zone review with the local fire department. Um, Battalion Chief Tyler Mortensen, uh, Paul Morgan, our GIS specialist, Captain Chris Ingram, were working through and had gone through the initial first pass at the zones, at the creation of the zones. There are several phases where we involve stakeholders uh, and the first part of that is the emergency services group sits down with the, for us it would be uh, Los Altos um, PD because there's some sections in there. It will be the sheriff's office and it is uh, Los Gatos Monasterino police. Those are the ones that are affected by the Zone Haven platform. It's basically all of the uh, communities that are to the west of 280 and 85. That was the amount of uh, money that we had available within our budget to secure for Zone Haven. Those are also the areas that are in the high and very high severity Wooey area. So we purchased this program, we sat down, we did our first patch, and before we had an opportunity to even have a stakeholder meeting, we had a large fire in, in Santa Cruz County that was threatening Los, Al uh, Los Altos Hills Fire Protection District, as well as Santa Clara County. So uh, Captain Rich Arena and myself from the Sheriff's Office sat down 
and we said we have nothing or we have this draft version of Zone Haven to go ahead and use along the 35 corridor skyline and Bear Creek and into the Redwood Estates area, Summit Road. So we decided that we would select the zones using the Zone Haven tool uh, where we interface with that to go ahead and provide us a barrier if the fire were to be if, uh, impacted by weather and blow over the county line. And we, uh, we worked uh, cohesively and cooperatively with uh, the Sheriff's Office to decide to go ahead and do a uh, evacuation warning uh, on that corridor within Santa Clara County to give our residents adequate time to prepare in advance of the weather uh, that could be pushing the fire in their direction. This is uh, to help the, the um, folks with large animals and pets evacuate, as well as those with functional needs, the extra and adequate time that they need to be able to secure their property and evacuate in a safe and orderly manner. Uh, three days later, the weather event passed and we were able to roll back. What's nice about this uh, product is it puts all of us on the same page. Uh, it uses a GIS layer, which allows us to be able to integrate some of those zones to our alerting system that is operated by the Office of Emergency Management and then administered by um, County Communications. So we can go ahead and utilize the IPAS, IPAS feature and be able to disseminate that information quickly and timely to the community. Uh, this is, again, it's in its early, early stages. Uh, and we were forced to have to make a decision to use nothing or the old style where you get out a map and you draw with a, a Sharpie and that becomes zone one and two, which has worked for many years. That was done on the SCU lightning fire on the opposite side of the county. Uh, but there's no way for anybody to interface with that through a, a portal. Uh, Community.zonehaven.com was stood up. Uh, you can still Google Zone Haven now and scroll down to the CZU page and actually see the 11 zones that Los Altos Hills has um, pre-scripted. And again, that's in their very first draft. They have not even been reviewed by the Sheriff's Office at this point. Uh, so we'll sit down with those stakeholders, uh, go through the emergency uh, operations piece, and then obviously bring it to the board and uh, to members of uh, the town to be able to see how those zones best fit their community. And that's where we take into considerations like CERT zoning and other zones that are already pre-created or pre-established within the communities. So at this point, it was a very, very rough uh, draft that we had thankfully available to use, which made it literally a mouse click away. That's how fast we were able to execute an evacuation advisory uh, warning or order. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, estimated timeline for rollout. Again, with all the large fires, we're slightly off target. We were hoping to have our first stakeholder meeting in September. That's now been pushed off due to the fact that, you know, our lead Chief Mortensen has been deployed several times to different fires around the state. But we expect it to be a project that we uh, uh, move full steam ahead this winter. Great. Thank you, Chief Class. Any questions from the commissioners? I have a question, Duffy speaking. Are you working with the CERT? Did you include CERT people are like Dave Stewart and Neil Caton, um, our Primo supervisors? Yeah, yeah. Commissioner Price, uh, that, that is part of the um, stakeholder meetings. We haven't had them yet due to the yeah. fact of the Good. timing, but they will definitely be, uh, uh, input will be uh, received from them as we move forward at our stakeholder meetings. That's terrific, thanks, great job. You're very welcome. Any other comments or questions of the commissioners? Anything from the public? Uh, Drew Anderson has a comment. Go ahead, Drew. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Chief Glass, uh, in uh, Los Altos Hills, I think Duffy, Duffy was kind of referring to that with the CERT uh, program they we put in place. Uh, the zones, for instance, I wanted to make a point for our zone two, where we had our initial wildland fire evacuation Sunday. Uh, at one point, we were zone two was part of a, we had more attachments to it, Bellary Ranch area, for instance, but the idea to keep zone two just Saddle Mountain was from a logistics aspect, we we aren't that big of a mountain, we're only several hundred feet, but uh, just to Trent, you know, transportation to get back and forth to, from a, either a search standpoint or just a community standpoint down to the Bellary Ranch and, and have that all one zone. Uh, we uh, asked that that could be um, just a separate zone. So zone two is to stir up 
Saddle Mountain, et cetera. And my question is, would that be taken into consideration when you're rezoning or would you be changing those dramatically? Um, so the evacuation zoning is completely separate at this point and doesn't take into any consideration the current CERT zoning. And I think that was uh, what we were given was built on GIS layers and road layers, um, which would, uh, uh, using a prediction software that Zone Haven has on where fires would start, which would be the best zone. So that we look at traffic control points, we look at ingress and egress, we look at which way the fire department would be responding from. And then of course the factor that is the most challenging is always the weather. It isn't like when we do flood planning. We do a lot of planning with cities and OEM about floods and evacuation routes. It's very predictable where the water is gonna go. But we saw in the campfire that the fire actually was blowing downhill, that the wind was trumping the slope and the natural uh, nature of fire to wanna burn uphill. So that is one of those things like, we don't necessarily wanna have pre-designated escape routes we want to have zones that we can notify people early so that they can get out in advance. Uh, we want to couple that with our Ready, Set, Go program that the district's been doing. Uh, I think it, it's, it's the next step in the chain, but absolutely, I think we want to find a way to make it easy for, for residents and constituents to be able to identify which zone they're in and when they need to evacuate. And sometimes it is possible to integrate the evacuation zones into the pre-established CERT zones, but they look at things differently. Uh, but a lot of the points that you're making uh, are things that we do look at, like ingress, egress, traffic control points. Um, uh, a lot of that, a lot of that activity is taken into account. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Anything else from the public? Dave Stewart. Okay, go ahead, Dan. Uh, yeah, I just want to say that um, I personally would not recommend that we focus too much on the CERT zones. They seem to be kind of arbitrary, and I would agree that for evacuation, we'd want to consider different zones. And I had a question about Zone Haven versus a different map set I discovered during the fires that was uh, also an ArcGIS.com uh, map set from the uh, Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District, and they had a CZU SCU fire map. And is this the same technology? Because I found this to be wonderful. Um, I'm with, without having a chance to see it, Mr. Stewart, um, I, I can't speak to the Mid-Peninsula mapping, but uh, we did use an ArcGIS for hosting to make it accessible to everyone in the different counties. Uh, I know that Mid-Peninsula was present at the evacuation meetings that we held uh, twice daily in Santa Cruz. Myself, as well as Lieutenant um, Neil, gosh, I can't remember his last name, but he's Rich Urain is number two on the west side. We're present at both of those meetings uh, each day, making sure that Santa Clara was represented. And I know uh, Brad from Mid-Peninsula was there uh, through the entire initial week. And then as it started to not be a threat to Santa Clara, um, Neil Valenzuela, Lieutenant Valenzuela, um, mm -hmm. and Brad uh, stopped attending the meeting because there wasn't really a need for them to be present. But uh, a, a lot of the information is being shared through ArcGIS, uh, and that's, that's a wonderful platform that we use for our, our GIS software. Yeah, I would agree. I liked it. Well, thank you. All right. Good. All right. Anything else from the public? All right. Thank you, Chief Glass. We will now move on to item eight, which is general manager report. Um, so let's go ahead with uh, item 8A, which is the district website, 8B, which is the OK resources sign, methods of delivery, and 8C, which is the September National Emergency Preparedness Month. We've got an open mic somewhere. And it's really cool. All right, you got it. Thank you, Sarah. And, and then finally, uh, uh, September, which is National Emergency Preparedness Month. Uh, General Manager Logan, please provide your update. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'll pick up the pace here and we'll go through these slides very quickly because the slide really gives the information that's necessary. Special Project Services <laughs> will discuss the district website, which is the first four slides. And then on slide five, Commissioner Price, would you just speak quickly about the event that was held uh, this week from the Los Altos Hills Club. Excuse me, and can we, can we we'll uh, I see Janice and Terry are unmuted and that might be the source of the audio problem. 
Okay. If we could have, if we could have Janice and Terry introduce themselves. That was wrong. Okay, that cleared. Okay, so uh, Sarah, would you go ahead with your presentation on the first four slides? And then Commissioner Price, would you uh, make some comments about slide five? Yes, um, you guys can see my slides, right? I, everyone is sounding very garbled, so I just want to make sure you can see everything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started with the revisions to the district website. Um, I'll go through these really quickly. Uh, the most important one, I think, really is this um, banner that we've added to the top of the website, which is a direct link to our most recent updates on emergencies like the wildfires. Uh, there are a number of different places where you can access this information throughout the website and that redundancy is intentional so people visiting our site will have an easy time finding that information when they need it. Uh, we've also added a strategic planning update page which is accessible through the link under latest updates on the home page. It includes all the materials from the two community meetings that we've had and we'll update this as the process progresses. Uh, we also had some feedback that the CWPP, Annex 4, and Addendum were difficult to find on our site, so we've added it to the drop-down menu um, of the About the District page. Um, Commissioner Kearney and Captain Gluhan gave a wonderful community presentation to the Los Altos Club, um, and I believe Duffy will talk about that, so I'll just skip it for now. Um, and then I wanted to give you a quick update on our social media accounts. Um, we haven't been following this, tracking this information very closely, um, but I wanted to, to point out this considerable increase in our followership uh, over the past month. And a lot of that is because of the wildfires and all of the um, situations that we've had going on in the county lately. And it's really important that if any commissioners or anyone in your network is following our page or has a social media account and isn't following our page that they start following it. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we want to connect with everyone in the district, but if we can connect with just one person who takes action because of some content that we share, uh, then our social media is a really successful strategy. Um, and then finally, I'll finish up here the okay cards and cover letter. Um, we had initially thought that we would just put these cards on our website um, and allow people to download as they, as they saw fit, but we had some direction to look at cost estimates for printing and mailing the cards. Uh, the cost estimates are before you on the screen and UPS provided a final estimate to me today, which was $16,097, not including tax. Uh, so definitely the highest um, estimate out of the four that I was able to secure. Um, so I'm seeking direction tonight from the commission as to whether you'd like to print and mail the cards, uh, which vendor you want to use, or if you want to just post it on the social media channels and our website, or if you would like to do a combination of both. Um, and sorry, I have one last slide. Uh, just a reminder that September is National Emergency Preparedness Month. We've been sharing posts on our social media accounts this month and, and for the rest of the month, we're sharing a post almost every day, uh, thanks to the great toolkit provided by Santa Clara County um, OES. Um, and please amplify these messages if you have your own social media accounts. We would love to uh, get the word out so people can start getting prepared. It's, it's very timely, as you all know. That's the end of my report. I'll go back to slide five for Commissioner Price whenever she's ready. Okay, great. <clears throat> I'm happy. Duffy. Oh, thank you. Uh, just to let you know that Commissioner Kearney and Captain Gluhan gave a tremendous presentation on September 8th uh, uh, jointly, and it was wonderful. And basically, uh, uh, Commissioner Kearney, as you probably know, uh, was a member of the SARS group that worked on the campfire and uh, paradise and it was in paradise. It was absolutely uh, heartwarming to see all the things that the uh, SARS group did. And uh, basically also uh, very emotional as a matter of fact, to all of my people that listened to it. This was presented before the Los Altos Hills Club of Los Altos Hills and uh, the newcomers club of Los Altos, Los Altos Hills. And the remarks were excellent. People were very impressed and very pleased Captain Gluhan uh, described beautifully the uh, entire new forward-looking uh, community resiliency plan 
and mainly uh, the IHFR chart that she presented. And she broke it down to explain what our services are. And she'll be going into more of that, I'm sure, tonight. But at any rate, both uh, presentations were outstanding and very well received. Uh, the report, the uh, recording of the uh, proceedings is uh, recorded via Zoom, which is really excellent. And today it is being mounted and with captions and will be on YouTube uh, on the website from the Los Altos Hills Club. And we will be sharing that with everyone. And by the way, this is another good thing using Zoom with these recordings. If you put them on YouTube, they're automatically captioned and can be converted into other languages. So uh, that's a uh, real attribute to having the Zoom meetings. So again, thank you uh, to Commissioner Kearney and to Captain Gluhim for a terrific presentation. Thank you, Commissioner Great. Price. I, I wanted to mention that uh, we've taken the presentation that was presented to the Los Altos Hills Club and with the assistance of Sarah and her technical skills, digested it down to six minutes of sound bites. We don't have time to show it tonight, but that would be something that can be used for strategic planning purposes and uh, for other purposes for audiences. So we're trying to Great. take all of our videos, make them uh, very, very um, short and easy to, to watch. Uh, I wanted to go back to the slide, Sarah, on the OK card as to how to send it out. And I'm thinking since that this is National Emergency Preparedness Month, maybe we could add that as a letter and go out with the OK card if that's the direction of the district to mail them to all the residences and have it be like a gift or some kind of a recognition of national of September being the National uh, Emergency Preparedness Month. So any comments or direction from the commission on whether to mail the cards to all residents, have a hybrid, also have it posted on the uh, website, please. Uh, what is your pleasure? I like Commissioners? To, uh, I like to recommend that we, uh, we send them out to all the residents it's through mail and we do social media and we do um, what's on our websites as well. And, and that way we cover the whole spectrum of, uh, of participation with the, uh, with the residents. That's, that's my, my, my second Melvin's, my second Melvin's thoughts. Okay, just one quick question I, I would have of uh, legal counsel, if I could ask Rob or Dan to chime in. Uh, do they see anything procurement wise that we should consider before moving in that direction? It's an issue that we uh, want to look into if the direction uh, from the commissioners is to mail them uh, before the next meeting, if that's possible, uh, we'll do it. There's some thought that we may need to come back in October with a more formal proposal or there may be ways uh, through the general manager's authority or otherwise right. uh, to do it between right. meetings, but we're not in a position to take action on the numbers that were presented uh, in the slide during the, the presentation this evening, but certainly uh, direction that if it's possible to do it before the next meeting, uh, we can take. And if it's not possible, then uh, similar to the fire station direction, it'll come back with a formal proposal during October. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other feedback from commissioners? Okay, that would uh, just everyone uh, recognize the National Emergency for Sure the month of September, and thank you. That concludes my remarks, Mr. President. Thank you, Jay. All right, with that, we'll move to item 9A, events and activities, 9B, community emergency response, CERT activities, and 9B1, revitalization of the ARC hub, and 9B2, emergency vest, 9C, operational data collection, integration, and mapping, revised proposal update, emergency services manager, Gluhan. Please provide the report. Thank you. Sarah's has the slides and I will try to uh, go through very quickly. I think there's a lot of enough pictures and uh, you can read along with the, uh, the descriptions. Uh, this is uh, some of the key things that we're going to mention tonight. Uh, first thing I just want to really quick show you on the left. I had these signs made so that uh, we could uh, let people know what was going on, especially with everybody heightened and concerned about the word evacuation. So we wanted to make sure that they understood that it was community training that was going on. Next slide, please. So again, the meetings are pretty much standard that I go to monthly. Uh, we've discussed a couple of the meetings uh, already. Uh, the club meeting, we've done a town council uh, orientation. 
uh, evacuation workshop that's actually was going on tonight also last week. Uh, some CERT coalition meetings and uh, regular fire safe council meetings with both project managers and going to their monthly meetings. And then uh, one of the, the key items that we've worked on over the last six months with the town of Los Altos Hills is the evacuation planning. Um, we're doing some upcoming videos and those are kind of ongoing. Next slide. So uh, we just concluded this last Sunday, the 13th, our first uh, evacuation drill. It actually started back before COVID. We actually met with our first meeting at Town Hall in, in one of the uh, meeting offices. Uh, and that was basically to say, you know, do we want to do this? What does it look like to do an evacuation? Obviously, well ahead of, of the uh, fire danger and evacuation potential that we saw in August. Uh, we had several meetings. Uh, we had several trainings. And then that culminated with a um, actual drill. Uh, one of the key exercise points of this was to have everyone sign up for early notification. Locally, it's Nixle. So we activated Nixle to say that we are doing a, uh, the evacuation drill. In addition, we put on there, if you'd like more information, please contact us and gave website and, and uh, phone number information and have had a lot of responses of other areas and, and neighborhoods that are very interested in having a similar event. So we, we got a, a little bit of traction out of uh, getting the notification out to the residents to evac and as a kind of a branding and marketing of what, what products we have available. The next step specifically for Saddle Mountain is to work on becoming a FireWise community and getting that national NFPA certification, uh, which has an annual uh, recertification and process. We had uh, 40 possible participants in this Saddle Mountain uh, drill in the, the area that we encompassed, we actually had 18 participants, which is, I think, a, for a first time was a very good turnout. Um, you know, it was on a Sunday morning. Uh, the residents picked the date uh, and we had a great turnout. You can see a couple of pictures down there in the bottom. Uh, Janice Carr, our uh, Commissioner Ann Cert uh, Ham uh, volunteer, is in her new vest. Uh, the residents drove to Preston Hills Park signed in on an, a sheet and then we're giving an evacuation registration form trying to simulate what being evacuated might look like. Next slide. So I'm going to turn uh, this over to Victoria if she'd like to give a report on the CERT uh, activities here inside of this report. Victoria? Victoria, you there? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and continue on. Um, yep. And if, if she can jump on, then great. Um, they've had to postpone several work days because of unstable weather, but they're working to finishing up, uh, you know, again, we've had that, you know, uh, hit the brake, hit the gas, hit the brakes, hit the gas, hit the brakes with the CERT program and getting the ARC set up again. Uh, things are definitely moving along. Um, again, for the time that we're in tonight, you can read those extra things that we're doing to maintain the trailers, the ARC, uh, kind of getting everything onto a maintenance schedule and getting people responsible for those items. A vest update, uh, we have received vests. Uh, Dave Stewart's been a gracious uh, coordinator to uh, work with distribution along with Neil. Uh, we have about half of the, um, the vests uh, distributed at this point. There's a picture of that and again an, an in live in person of Janice wearing her new vest. She was highly visible so we are definitely meeting uh, the needs of that. We are still working on the clear pocket edition so that we can have the ID readily available uh, on that vest but it's a, a great improvement for visibility. Next slide. Denise, Denise I'm yes. back on. Sorry I got kicked okay. out. All right. Sorry everybody. Hello. Um, <clears throat> So activities and updates for CERT, um, our meeting schedule is going to be remaining at two trainings and two meetings a month. Um, we have a general CERT meeting and a CERT supervisor meeting. Um, our uh, training has been focused a lot on recon during COVID. Um, obviously things have uh, kind of changed a little bit. Um, we're gonna be asking ECC to be giving their thoughts on um, that procedure before we, we put it out. Um, we're doing a three part series underway for recon. Um, we've got a homework challenge going on right now um, for looking at some critical infrastructure um, and hopefully um, I'll have a, a really great report for you guys next time on how well that went. Um, we also had to um, unfortunately postpone some of our training uh, videos that we we're going to start uh, putting up 
um, because of the weather. So I'm hoping that next time also I'll have a much better report for you guys on being able to do some more um, filming and video um, for some of our ARC activation um, to get some people to be able to come out and do some of the, the, the drills and training network that are needed. Great. Hey, Victoria. Thank you, Good Victoria. <laughs> Thank you. And then um, to just finish off this slide, I'm going to ask Sarah, just give a quick update on uh, where we're at on the uh, operational data collection, uh, integration and mapping. Sarah? Sure. So along with Commissioner Spreen, staff has met with Lynx Technologies to discuss changes to the proposal that was provided at the last meeting. Uh, we recently received that revised proposal based on the discussion that we have and we have plans um, in the next few weeks to meet with Neil as was also directed at the last meeting to review. Um, if time allows, we're hoping to bring a scope and a PSA to the commission in October or November. End of report. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Right, so next thank slide, you. please. I think, do we have, is that it for the, oh yeah, this will be another, this will be farther down in the agenda. If we can hold those, Sarah. All right. Uh, thanks, Emergency okay. Services Manager Gluhan. Are there any discussion on the commission on this report? Any comments from the public? Hearing none. Hang on a second. All right, we'll Dave move Stewart on here. to. Oh, Sorry, go ahead, I just had a second to get unmuted. Um, I just wanted to point out to Sarah that Neil may not be available for a while, and that I've also volunteered to help with the mapping. Dave Stewart. Great. Thank you, Dave. Great. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, with that, we'll move to item 10, which is the uh, fire hydrant report. Item 10A, horseshoe lane erosion report, uh, repair report, general manager. Um, Logan, please provide the report. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. For comments on the horseshoe lane erosion repair project, I'd like to again introduce Jeff Tarantino, who's our engineer with Fire and Loretta uh, Engineering Consulting. Jeff is the engineering consultant to the district and will provide an update on the horseshoe lane hydrant event and resulting soil erosion that occurred on the district vacant lot. So Jeff, thank you for joining us tonight. And um, please, we're looking forward to your comments. Great, thank you so much, uh, General Manager Logan and directors, thank you for having me. Hopefully, can everybody hear me okay? I'm using a older microphone. You're fine. Okay, great. Can hear you. Thank you. So um, first we wanted to talk about Horseshoe Lane. And uh, Sarah, I don't know if there was the, the report was attached to the agenda, which was the uh, separate file from what I, this, this file is this. Uh, yes, it was, it was attached. Do you want to display that as well? Yeah, report? do you mind? Yeah, no problem. Uh, go ahead and, and keep talking and I'll pull it up. Great. So um, as the uh, directors will remember, in December 2019, a, um, a fire hydrant on Horseshoe Lane was hit. Um, it, um, water was released, causing erosion on the hillside. Due to the time of year, um, the erosion was essentially led to, to kind of lay dormant. And um, we've been kind of taking a look at the area and recently completed a topographic survey um, to determine kind of the extent of the erosion. Um, in evaluating the topographic survey, um, uh, sir, if, you go to, if you could go to um, the second to last page of, of this. In evaluating the extent of the erosion um, and looking at the grading requirements for the town of Los Altos Hills, um, we have found that the, the existing slope is, um, and, it, and, it's, and I apologize, it's kind of an engineering drawing here, but you can see in the kind of the middle of the drawing, there are kind of oblong and shapes that, that represent the contours where, where we found the erosion damage. So within that 40 by 40 foot approximate area, we're finding that the, the soils are, are steep and rugged and need to be um, replaced. And so if we go to the next image, um, very simply, we're gonna um, implement a, a grading plan to restore the slope, uh, to match the contours and grading um, outside of the area of repair. Um, in order to proceed with this project, um, we're gonna take a couple of steps. Uh, first, FNL will be preparing uh, construction drawings uh, to show uh, the, the repairs. Um, we will be submitting those drawings to the town of Los Altos Hills in order to secure a grading permit, which is required by their grading ordinance in order to, um, uh, in order to perform the work. We will be coming back to the commission in October 
uh, to present the construction drawings. Um, we'll give you a progress update on our coordination with the town of Los Altos Hills. And at that time, um, General Manager Logan will be requesting uh, authority to issue the project to competitive bid. After we go to competitive bid, we'll follow uh, public contracting codes, um, secure bids, and then once those bids have been evaluated, we will come back to the commission. The intent is to come back at the November meeting um, to present the results of the bids and, and request direction on um, and how to proceed, assuming we, we receive uh, uh, sufficient bids and, and can deem uh, the lowest responsive bidder. Once um, we get to that point, we'll proceed with the work, which at this point, um, FNL is estimating it's approximately two weeks worth of work um, in order to um, clear and grab the site, restore the grading to stabilize the slope, um, and then we will provide uh, temporary erosion control measures over the slope such that it could, um, as, we, as we will also place uh, uh, a material called hydro seeding, which is essentially a, a material you use to um, uh, place seeds that are fast growing with typically uh, native plants uh, that will ultimately be the permanent erosion control. So that is the end of my report and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, um, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jay. Are there any discussion from the commissioners on this topic? Yeah, Jeff, uh, this is uh, Melvin. Uh, what do you anticipate um, this is gonna cost? I know we haven't got any bids on it yet, but what do you think it's gonna cost? Yeah, uh, yeah thank you, Director. Um, Sarah, would you mind scrolling up? We actually included our initial opinion of probable project cost. Um, there's a table on, I think it's, there it is right there at the bottom. So, so what we've what we've estimated um, for construction based on um, uh, similar work in the area and our experience of approximately forty eight thousand dollars for the construction. The design fee there is um, the fee that um, FNL is uh, under our on call agreement is is our projected um, work for topographic survey and our design fee. Um, the permitting fee is our estimate based on reviewing the um, fees from the from the town's uh, website. Uh, and then construction management is again an estimate on our part, it would be uh, potentially for FNL to assist the district with um, managing the construction contract and um, providing periodic inspection of the work. And then district, district administration fee is just a, an, an estimate that we provide. So the total opinion or probable cost uh, is their uh, director at 62,400. Gotcha. And so yeah. what's the, um, what would be the pros and cons of doing nothing other than adding like straw and wattle down at the bottom of the road mm -hmm. and um, eliminating the cost? So, so currently there is a, um, I don't want to use a significant, but a, a fairly, um, rut that's adjacent to the road. So what our concern would be it, that soil, if it got wet significantly again, um, just from rain, just from, even though there are some, there are grasses that have established and, and, you know, it appears to be in reasonable condition. My concern is that over time that that soil would continue to be destabilized and eventually could, could result in, in, in further erosion and soil displacement. Um, and with the proximity to the road and some of the trees, it you know over time it could become a, a larger concern, kind of requiring a larger repair in the future. Gotcha. So it appears that uh, besides just grading, you'll have to do a lot of compacting as well, probably, huh? Yeah, we will. And so um, what we're what we're developing is um, likely uh, using uh, some some excavation and and benching to create mm -hmm. um, opportunities to place um, probably a, a couple of feet of, of class two AB, so more of a kind of an engineered fill. And as we do the grading and, st and, and building the bench, we're actually gonna try and save some of the native soils there that will be then placed over the, the, the aggregate base. Um, so that aggregate base would kind of uh, serve as a stabilizing material, it's much like what we do when we're building roads. We wanna have this kind of this aggregate base we can compact and and get it to be a very, very uh, stable surface that we can then put soil that's more appropriate for plantings on top of it, you know, a foot or two using the hydro seeding and then jute nesh netting that we'll place over the top of it for the erosion control to, to allow that, that the, the plants to establish and kind of hold the, the topsoil together. Copy. Now, do you think you have to put keyways in as well? Uh, yes, we're, we're thinking we're probably going to put um, a small keyway at the bottom and one about halfway, halfway up the slope, but we're still developing those details at this point. Gotcha. All right. Thank you. You're welcome.
All right. Just, Any further questions? Yeah, go ahead, Jay. Yes, I just wanted to point out also uh, to remind the <laughs> group that these, um, uh, these incidents were uh, are covered under insurance by the drivers that hit the hydrant and hopefully we'll be able to uh, present this to the insurance company and receive reimbursement for the cost. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jay. Sure. Thanks, Jay. Any other questions from the commissioners? Anything from the public? All right, thank you, General Manager Logan. Uh, we will now move on to item 11, which is the hazardous fuel reduction report, um, 11A. Uh, yeah, I think we have to go back um, to 10B. Oh, so, yeah, I was getting ahead of myself. Um, okay. 10B, which is hydrant repairs. Yes, um, this is a fascinating report, and I just wanted to hear um, Mr. Tarantino have an opportunity to tell you the other kinds of projects going on with hydrants right now, and particularly this uh, uh, standard detail, which is, is very, very important to, to the district to understand. So, Jeff, it's all yours. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jay. So uh, the the other the other uh, project we've been assisting uh, the district with is the town of Los Altos Hills um, is nearly complete with their um, I believe what they call their 2020 street resurfacing project. So they've gone through the the town in several locations, um, performing uh, repairs to the street overlays, and as part of that process, when they do the street overlay, uh, they have to identify all the various um, utility. Uh, indicator so manhole covers for this for the sewer for the storm drain and in our case the the covers for our valves um, so if you're looking at this this detail here um, in the elevation view it's the it's the image to the to the right you know this is our assembly um, with the below ground showing the the valve and and rising up through the bury to the fire hydrant and you see the call out that says gate valve assembly there's a little cover that goes on top of that gate valve assembly that essentially is flush with the road. And that, that cover allows uh, firefighters to open up and then you know, operate the gate valve that's, that's buried. So when, when we perform a road resurfacing project um, that typically adds uh, thickness to the road, it essentially, you know, in this case, I think they added one to two inches of, of AC to the, to the surface in order to um, make the, the surface drivable and not cause any, any water or any, any, any material from getting and covering the valve cover, uh, the contractor actually has to come back, remove uh, enough asphalt around the valve cover and then um, raise the valve and then restore the, the valve by placing, there's actually uh, the two to three inches of concrete that actually collar that actually hold around the valve cover to stabilize it. So, so that's, you know, wanted to use this detail um, from the Prisma Hills Water District that, that shows our fire hydrant. So um, O'Grady Paving was performing the work on behalf of the town and they have um, completed a majority of the work that required raising of six valves for the, for the, um, uh, for the district, also placing blue dots next to the hydrants. And um, that work has been complete. There's still uh, work to be completed on one final street, uh, Desahara Des Way. Um, which uh, the town's waiting for the water district to finish up their Tafe Elena uh, project. So, um, Sarah, would you mind scrolling down to the next uh, page? So, um, after the work was complete, um, we were asked to do a site visit. And so, what you can see here in this photo um, is a fire hydrant near 12190 Padre Court. And you can see kind of in the, in the kind of the foreground of the photo, the, the new asphalt surface with the new striping, and you can see where the trucks are kind of parked in the background. That's that portion of the street was not resurfaced. So you can tell that just the color difference. Um, and there was a, a, a valve cover there in the, in the, in the, in front of the hydrant and that valve, you can see where they um, actually um, removed some of the new asphalt around the valve cover in order to raise it and then placed um, a new asphalt around it to stabilize it. And then, what the practice has been for all the district valve covers to be actually painted yellow um, so that the uh, water district, personal Mills water district can visually distinguish which are our valves versus which are their valves. So I had a couple more photos, if we can go to the next one. Um, again, same condition, fire hydrant behind back of curb, uh, the valve was raised and then a blue dot placed. And then one final photo where we did have one of our, our fire hydrants within the limit of work. The valve is actually in the landscaped area. 
So no valve raising was required on our part. And then the blue dot was placed in the road. So that was, again, work we're coordinating with, with uh, district staff in, um, in, in the town of Los Altos Hills. And um, Jay and I just thought it was uh, important information to share with the commission. Uh, yes, and, and Jeff, I think it demonstrates those three photos. That underneath the ground is where the bury is and then the lateral that attaches to the uh, gate valve that mm -hmm. then goes up to the cover. Uh, and all of those, the, those pieces of equipment belong to the fire district. Correct. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And uh, commissioners, thank you very much for the opportunity to support and uh, looking forward to continuing work with you. But unless there's anything else, I'm going to excuse myself from the meeting. Uh, Mr. President, President Orn, you, you are muted. Ah. Mr. President, you're muted. Okay, now I'm unmuted. All right, let's move to 11A, which is brush chipping and debris removal program. Pilot project analysis areas four, five, six, and one. Special project services consultant Hendricks, please present the report. Thank you, President Warren. Uh, so before you, as it loads, is a cost summary of the pilot program for March through July. Um, I'll let you look at the numbers there. We did have a, a little bit of a reorganization of this um, chart based on the feedback that we received at the last commission meeting. Uh, so you can see at the bottom there, the total monthly program costs and then the actual payment to Fire Safe Council. So our total monthly program costs since March uh, is about $103,000. Uh, keep in mind that that does include the $20,000 um, pre-funding that we provided to FSC in March of this year. Um, the total costs for July are just under $34,000, which is a, a, a bit higher than what we had seen in the previous months, but those costs are all due to the contractors. Um, the bids coming in a little bit higher. Um, and on this page, again, we have the operations data. Uh, the last section of the table here at the bottom is for July area one. You've seen the previous three tables um, in, in, the, in the, what, April through June meetings, uh, or April through July. Um, 69 residents received chipping services in July. Uh, 5,200 cubic yards of brush were chipped. Uh, it's a little bit more than what we've seen in the past. Uh, the cost per cubic yard of brush did increase to $5.35 this month due to higher bids received from the contractors. Uh, end of report. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Any questions from the commission? Any questions from the public? All right. Let's now move to 11. Um, what do we got here? Um, Jay, what do we got? Um, 11A1, and I'll speak to that. Oh, yeah, please. 11A1? Yes. Um, so 11A1 is to just give an expression of services for unexpected circumstances. Uh, this is regard to the brush chipping program. And at times, uh, we receive calls from residents where an unanticipated limbs fall or they need mm -hmm. emergency trimming. And in such events, the district can arrange, can make arrangements for that chipping in the next weekly cycle, depending upon the contractor schedule, the timing of the bids and the location of the property. And some examples that happened this last month were a couple of tree limbs fell that were quite large or trees actually fell. The resident went out, chopped it up, put it into piles and then asked for it. Another issue was trimming some brushes off electrical wires and the branches behind and the district up and goes up with the chipping. Uh, these special circumstance requests are important. Every effort's made to remove piles. However, also important is the area approach to monthly tripping, chipping, <laughs> which is the mainstay of the program for, national, nat, for maximum efficiency and service and cost. So that's the end of my comments on um, A1. Um, Anything for A1? Mm-hmm. Moving down to A2, Sarah, do we have a slide on this? 
Uh, yes, it should be on your screen, the standards for breast chipping. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, so in the new program, the new pilot program, we've established some standards and the standards are there for you. One of them is the contractor safety standard and that has to do with having a spotter designated if the vehicle that the um, crew is using is in a backup motion. And then the other is the standards for COVID-19, very important. And then there's a third bullet there that talks about the use of good judgment is required of the crews because when they're out there, various things happen and they just are always advised to use good judgment. And then the fourth standard is the chipping. Uh, we've had some residents who've said that they don't like the quality of the chips that they're receiving from that are left behind. And one of the standards that we have is whatever goes into the front of the chipper is gonna come out the other side of the chipper. It's not a matter of the setting on the chipper, it's a matter of what goes in. So the expectation is not that we can convert leaves and debris into chipping that is a garden quality. So I just wanted to make those standards aware of uh, to the commission in case you receive any comments from residents, you'll have these standards to kind of fall back on and, and recognize. And then the next. Great, thank you. Sure. Yeah. And then is George, there another slide there, Sarah, or do we go to three? Eleven A three. Yes. Uh, we just have two really quick slides, um, but the commission oh, yes, is, is happy to read them uh, on their own. It's just some observations from Emily Drain, our FSC representative. Um, a few of the issues that we've run into, or that she's run into, while actually implementing the program, um, but they're really only a handful each month. Um, for example, not having contact information on mail-in cards, locked gates, uh, multiple piles, and then cancellations, which you saw on the operations slide that I provided. Um, and then just a, a brief update of some process improvements that we've done to the program. So we actually um, got a business reply permit. Previously, we were pre-paying for all of the registration cards. Now we're only paying for the cards that are returned to us, which should be a pretty significant cost savings. Uh, we've streamlined the chipping calendar so that people are not seeing as big a window between when they receive the registration cards and when chipping actually begins. Hopefully that'll eliminate anyone misplacing the card or forgetting to, to register by the deadline. And then of course, as one of the problems mentioned previously, that people weren't providing their information on the cards. Um, we just highlighted that language in the mailers and inform residents that their service might be denied if they don't provide that information. End of report and no more slides on this item. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. All right. So, Jay, are we now moving to 11A3, written authorization for approval of payments over $30,000 for brush shipping services? General yes. Manager Logan? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. So, what occurred uh, because Corey, Sarah, and I very closely monitor the bids that are coming in from contractors, we did some simple math and we realized that. In, the, in this last month, in the month of July, that it looked like we were going to be billed for over $30,000. The, the agreement with fire, with the brush chipping agreement with Fire Safe Council has a max limit per month at $30,000. Now we have not received those uh, invoices yet. Um, and so as far as our invoices received, we're not over the $30,000. But I wanted to bring that to the attention of the commissioners and in that section of the compensation of the uh, professional services agreement, there is a opportunity to provide written authorization for approval of payment over $30,000 for the breast chipping services. And I can have Dan Siegel or, or Rob Coelho to comment on that, but we do need to work out some kind of an arrangement. And then in October, the plan is to come back with a different, probably an amendment to that agreement to where we're not on a monthly basis because we're not able to really gauge and react quickly enough as to all the, the demand for chipping and the cost of the chipping through the bidding process. So that's an introduction to um, 11A3. And Dan, Rob, if you want to make comment with me opening that question to you. Thank you. Rob, do you want to go? Dan? Um, well, I'm, I'm ha well, go ahead, Dan, if you've got anything to say, otherwise I'm happy to jump in. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, General Manager Logan uh, pointed out uh, the contract allows for pre-authorization. So we're looking in 
how to do that if indeed billing comes in at over $30,000 a month. And more importantly, as she stated, uh, to determine how to watch um, this, especially in this time where there's greater chipping because of heightened awareness, because of the fires and people being at home and having the time to do it. We want to encourage uh, items that keep properties safe and practice hygiene uh, and figure out the best way um, to enable that to happen and what type of authorization uh, would be necessary uh, to process these bills if indeed they do come in in the amount that Sarah and Jay expect them to. Thank you. And, and to add that to that, you know, obviously among the options would be increasing the amount above the 30,000, uh, having the, uh, as uh, Jay indicated, having the uh, time period be like a quarterly basis instead of a monthly basis, such that if there was a significant amount in the month of September, but lighter in October, you might be within the uh, agreed upon and acceptable range at the end of a quarter. Uh, there'll be multiple options, which we can assess from a legal perspective then present to you all uh, in October. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. But I will uh, then go ahead and send a written authorization, if that is all right, to Fire Safe Council, just indicating that there is uh, that, that it is okay to make payment over thirty thousand dollars if indeed we receive any invoices over thirty thousand. Is that what I take from this conversation? Do you need direction or a motion? Or do you need approval from the commission, or do you need it from legal, Jay? No, I'm just just disclosing because it's it's already in the uh, agreement to be able to do this, mm -hmm. and so just wanting to disclose that that's the plan. I. I would take unless there is some reason not to do that. I'm in favor of being able to, you know, approve payment over $30,000 if necessary. Any feedback from other commissioners? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Agreed. So, so a consensus there to- uh, Consensus of the commission. Yeah, to use that, fra that, that uh, fa phrase that's already in the uh, agreement. Okay. Yes. Okay. If people are willing to, bring it we want to chip it yes we do yeah there'll probably be a policy discussion at some point in time is to if it's just open-ended and then how we control costs if there is a desire to do that but i think we're on a good track of encouraging and seeing the response from the community seeing the need from the community always finding that this is a fire safe practice is to rid the environment as much as possible from um, fire fuels and so I think we're on the right track and that's what uh, the program's all about. So thank you. And the end of my sure. report on uh, item 11. 11A. Nope. 11A. Yeah. 11A. Now let's move to 11B, which is the home ignition zone um, services uh, uh, um, program. Emergency, Emergency services program. coordinator, Gluhan. Yeah, so I'm not gonna take a bunch of time on this slide. This is the... Um, I want to also introduce, there's, uh, let me make sure he's still on here. Eddie, are, is, is Eddie still on here? <laughs> yes. We're so late. He is, okay. Um, so Eddie Sanchez is uh, replaced JR uh, as our um, uh, project manager, and he's underneath Jeff, who is the new overall project manager. He's doing the majority now of the workload of our home ignition zone inspections. Uh, back in November, when we originally talked and I introduced uh, Fire Safe Council in their suite of uh, educational at the residential level programs. These were the 60 programs that we've purchased. Uh, giving an update on that, to, to date, uh, 46 have been completed. Uh, these, might, these numbers were as of last week, so he's actually probably done a couple more. Uh, 13 pending and two were canceled. So that gets us right at 60, it's 59 when you do those numbers. Uh, so that's been a, a, a well accepted program or well utilized program. Uh, even under COVID, which has been a, a little bit of a challenge. Um, I want to thank Eddie for going out, uh, have very positive feedback. Um, I was going to uh, give you some some other information about people who've emailed me and uh, told me that, you know, they thank you for the report. We're going to go out and have, you know, do the work ourselves or have a gardener get started. And we've also seen that increase some of the chipping that we just discussed. But this is what they get. Uh, these are the tops of the two forms that they receive. So I just wanted to kind of give you in case you forgot what the home ignition zone inspection is. Um, and then we'll look at uh, maybe getting some more of these sometime soon because we only secured 60 initially because we weren't sure what we were going to need. Can we do the next slide? 
Eddie, did you have anything you wanted to say about the HIZs really quick since we're on that before we go to this? Uh, overall, it's been a good progress. A lot of uh, good feedback I've received. So overall, I think it's a great program provided for the residents. And as far as I know, it's a free program until the end of this year. Starting next year, we're going to start uh, charging for that service. Yeah, and just, just to update, we, you, we are actually charging because we aren't in the WUI. We do pay for those 60 now, so we'll have to contract for more. It currently is free right. to all the, uh, and no cost to all the residents currently, uh, but that's because the fire district had purchased uh, those 60. Um, yeah, along with some, for it. yeah, along with the workshops that uh, we've been doing, the wildland uh, evacuation workshops, and then some more community workshops that we would like to do once we figure out uh, how to do that inside COVID. Another part of that uh, collaboration that we started with the Fire Safe Council was to do uh, the shaded fuel breaks. We had the Fire Safe Council's monthly meeting today. Uh, Chief Ori uh, talked uh, and Chief Sansom from the um, Santa Cruz fire and they spoke of, of how well the fuel breaks performed in both of these fires, especially in Santa Cruz, the shaded fuel breaks. Um, but the time to do a shaded fuel break is not with an approaching fire. You know, so it's not, the time to do it is when there's not fire, you're not under evacuation. It's the time to do it is outside of those, those periods of time. But they, they were very effective. Um, I know on Highway 17, they had a car fire in an area where they had a, a, a a more severe outcome when the shaded fuel break wasn't in place. So it's definitely an important um, uh, egress in evacuations. That was the other component he spoke to. Uh, the areas that had the shaded fuel breaks did definitely make evacuation safer. Uh, and I think that shows in the numbers of only the, the one death up at the CZU fire. And that was somebody who waited uh, far too long from a, a very extended evacuation. Um, so in that, uh, we're working now to get phase two of the shaded fuel break started. And I'll let Eddie speak to the phase two uh, components, and then we'll get down to the bottom picture after that. Eddie? Yes, so um, phase two would be from Altamont Circle all the way to Via Ventana Way, and that's approximately 0.6 miles. And it's just one of our typical escape routes um, where we try to um, thin out the areas, limb up the trees up to four feet, 14 feet high, uh, making sure there's visibility with uh, uncom oncoming traffic and other uh, pedestrians such as bike bicyclists and other means of uh, transport, uh, road transportations. Um, overall, um, I'm in the planning stages of getting bids. Uh, I would estimate the amount would be around fifteen to twenty thousand dollars and um, I have sent out bids to the contractors and to get uh, bids on traffic control as well thanks Eddie great um, and we'll give you more information as we get those RFPs and whatnot for the next meeting but I just wanted to let you know since we've uh, come back, missed, uh, we missed the meeting we didn't have meetings last month and then with the uh, management audit and whatnot staff hours have been a little bit delayed on some of these projects. So again, the real importance of those incipient fires um, and then especially life safety on evacuations and then eventually expanding these projects and looking at temporary refuge areas and you know all of the life safety things that we're talking about that tie in you know, exactly with the evacuations that we did, uh, the practice that we did up on Saddle Mountain. All of that's to prepare a resilient population that's trained and knows why we're doing what we're doing and what routes to use and, and how to get out safely. So we're really, you know, really, really the education with the Zone Haven incorporating that, um, you know, as we improve these, uh, you know, these routes into to those plannings to look at those and identify the highest need areas and work towards those next. So um, just continue working on with this and we'll keep uh, collaborating with the County Fire and Fire Safe Council for those next stages. All right, to the last item here, and my, I know we're very late, so I will go quickly on this. And uh, this kind of ties in with, the, um, with our report from the engineers earlier. Uh, one of the items I went out to look at the hydrant issues 
found the problem of having an overgrown lot that we have on our parcel at 27500 Rascadero Road. You can see a couple pictures there. That's a dead fruit tree up in a corner. This is a, an oak tree that has dead vegetation and has, has a lot of ladder fuel down to the ground. We walked around. If you look to that far corner, you can see 14 little dots. Eddie has made a map. We walked around at each of those are unique sites that we're going to do some sort of vegetation management. We're going to interface with um, Jackson, who's the videographer, and uh, bring in Emily uh, to make it a, a really uh, comprehensive lateral and vertical fuel um, vegetation educational video presentation and clean up our lot. So it's, a, it's kind of a, a demonstration lot of, you know, here's something in your area uh, that we've gone in and cleaned and I recognize that we needed a little bit more love than mowing. Typically it just gets mowed um, and then in addition uh, we do have the erosion that's going to be worked on eventually but that's not uh, included in any of this report. This is just vegetation or hazardous fuel management and there's the mix of everything. There's grasses, brush, trees, um, you know anything you can think of uh, we're going to have quite a, a, a video montage of, of different types of fuel management and fuel reduction. And Eddie's, uh, you wanna to talk to speak to the, uh, the costs that we have so far? Uh, we've gotten um, three bids back and they range between $4,000 to $6,000. So the other component that will happen with that as it's, it's a little bit higher than just doing the work because they're going to have to coordinate with videography um, to it'll be a little slower than say just go clean this lot we want to show what we're doing when we talk about a ladder fuel removing the ladder fuels and again we can break these down into small uh, videos to put on our youtube site again to give people that educational component uh that might help them in their own neighborhood because this is what their neighborhood looks like this is the vegetation they have growing in their property it's not looking at the conifers up in the sierras and saying this is what you should do to your parcel for fuel mitigation. So uh, it kind of is, we're able to, a little bit of sloping, we're able to address all those items. And in my report for that, if there's any questions on any of these three items, thank you. So that's great. Um, thank you. I'm looking forward to the product there uh, on the district lot. And thank you, Eddie, for moving forward on um, phase two of the shaded fuel break. All right, is there any comments or questions from the commissioners on items 11? Any from the public? All right, hearing none, we will now move to item 12, adoption of resolution 20-29 of the Los Altos Hills County Fire District authorizing execution of an agreement between the County of Santa Clara and Los Altos Hills County Fire District for executive legal services. Items 12 and 13 are related. We will begin with, uh, with item 12A, memorandum report. General Manager Logan, please provide the report. You're muted, Jay. Sorry, thank there you, President. Um, the memorandum report, which is 12A, establishes the purpose and background for the resolutions 20-29 and 20-30 and the recommend recommendations before the commission. I'll provide additional comments under each item. So that's just my introductory statement. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay, thank you, General Manager Logan. Moving to 12B, um, which is the resolution uh, 2029, resolution of Los Altos Hills County Fire District authorizing execution of an agreement between the County of Santa Clara and Los Altos Hills County Fire District for executive legal services. Uh, General Manager Logan, please introduce the resolution. Uh, yes. The uh, thank you, Mr. President. The adoption of resolution 20.29 authorizes execution of an agreement between the County of Santa Clara and the district for exclusive legal services. The management audit report recommended direction to the district to discontinue representation by private counsel and to use county council as its exclusive representative to provide district legal services. The district is a dependent district of the county and is subject to the findings and recommendations of the management audit process as directed by the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors. In the district's 
post audit report plan, the district commission ad hoc management audit subcommittee agreed to this recommendation and requested immediate assignment of county council to the district due to the upcoming management audit proceedings and pending legal matters. The county responded by assigning county council and offered the exclusive legal services agreement between the county and the district effective August 19th, 2020. Approval of resolution 20-29 is recommended by the subcommittee to the commission. Thank you, that's the end of my report. All right, any questions for John Andrew Logan from the commission? Uh, is this time for comment as well as question? Uh, go ahead, Roger. Uh, Normally, I would, I would have no problem with this. And in fact, I, I'm, I recognize that transition to the sort happen all the time. And they're happy to have someone on else on board to uh, help us proceed the way we are with all our uh, mission here. But given that at, this is tied in with the consolidation issue, uh, in which we find ourselves um, at somewhat at odds with county, is it uh, does this put Mr. Coelho in a spot where he is not necessarily um, able to deal with us in our questions about our legal dealings with the county? Is there any issue there? Um, again, if this were just the audit findings and how we manage ourselves, I see no issue. Just seems like for the next two months, we have an issue where we might need legal representation that doesn't have any conflict with who Mr. Coelho's ultimate uh, employer is. So I can speak to that. And uh, prior to bringing this resolution to you, the, the uh, Commission Ad Hoc Management Audit Subcommittee met on a couple of occasions and spoke about this transition, met with um, Assistant County Counsel Rob Coelho and went through, I think, a series of very forthright and honest questions, many of which spoke exactly to what the concern that you're stating, Commissioner Spreen. And at the end of that discussion, there was, um, I think, a level of understanding as to how the district would receive advocacy and uh, legal advice that is not in conflict with any of the county's proceedings. So I can just say that kind of as a general overview, and then I could maybe ask uh, Rob Quello if he would like to comment a little further and maybe just talk about the ethical wall and how that is set up to avoid these kinds of circumstances that ha happen really frequently within the county with county council representing various departments and various activities going on within the county and how that advocacy is, is uh, promoted uh, for whomever the client is. Thank you. I'm happy to provide some information. So Rob Coelho, Assistant County Counsel. Um, first of all, as we all heard it, when Supervisor Samidian presented his comments uh, at the outset of the meeting, which um, seems like it was uh, a bit ago, but it was it was the same meeting. Uh, I think he made the, the real point, which is the decision uh, as it relates to uh, delegation of authority and the decision as it relates to uh, consolidation are, are political decisions. Um, and they're not legal ones. I mean, the legal question is, does does the board have the authority to pull the, revoke the revocation, uh, the delegation? Yes. I, mean, I think everybody agrees that the, the uh, ad hoc committee agrees with that. It, it was given by the board. It can be taken away by the board. And so there's no conflict there. That's a political issue that needs to be resolved politically, which is why I think Supervisor Samidian made the comments he did earlier today. As it relates to um, uh, the consolidation, it's the same issue. It, it's, uh, I can opine as to whether or not it's legal uh, to provide for some sort of consolidation? The answer to that is yes. The, the real question is, is a, is a political one, will it occur? In terms of advising the district where I do see uh, the potential for conflict and where we would have an ethical wall set up for certain would be as it relates to uh, contracts between this district and Central Fire, for example. So you, you've got a contract with the Central Fire uh, uh, protection district uh, for services and what we would set up within our office for certain is and have it are already set it up as an ethical wall such that if I'm advising the district as it relates to the contract 
with another party, Central Fire, or even if there were a contract with the county, we would set up an ethical wall so that you would get a clear, unbiased legal representation as to that legal relationship, which is a contractual relationship with the other party. And similarly, the fire uh, district, Central Fire, would, would get uh, uh, county council assigned to them. What that means within our office is I don't have access to uh, Central Fire files as it relates to contracting with Los Altos uh, County, uh, at Los Altos Hills, uh, nor would they have access to my files. Um, we, we don't share information. We've got ethical walls set up throughout the office in multiple uh, types of uh, scenarios. I, I can give a couple of examples. Although we represent both the DA and the public defender uh, on civil matters, you know, technically they have conflicts in criminal matters and to the extent to the extent we're brought into a criminal matter on behalf of one department we set up an ethical wall so there won't be uh, the sharing of confidential information or communications um, among those more realistically where it ha would happen is with an elected official so you've got the elected sheriff you've got the elected assessor you've got the elected district attorney and we're the attorneys for the county as a whole um, but it may be that an elected official um, would, would have uh, interest based on constitutional authority would be different than the county to the extent that we, uh, so right now, for example, uh, there are three attorneys in our office who are advising the sheriff on a specific matter where there may be a conflict with the county board of supervisors. Uh, I'm on the side of the ethical wall advising the sheriff. I'm not on the county side of that ethical wall. And so uh, although we, ha we communicate uh, with respect to things that we can, we don't share confidential information and my client as it relates to that representation on that issue, because that's where the conflict is, is the sheriff. Um, since the board of supervisors um, is essentially, is, is realistically the oversight body uh, of this entity, um, in summary, uh, to the extent there's a political dispute, we don't opine on that. We don't get involved in that. We don't advocate on that. That's a political issue to the extent there are legal issues. Uh, if a conflict were to arise, we would set up an ethical wall internally. But as to the two issues that are most significant to you, uh, based on the discussion today, consolidation and the uh, change of the delegation authority, those, as I've said, are political and, and our office will speak with one voice as it relates to that because it's, that's, you know, legally can it be done? And, and then legally, what are the options in terms of doing it? Those answers are going to be the same no matter who the uh, who asked the question. I hope I hope that answers it. And if I didn't answer it as specifically as you'd like, I'm I'm happy to try to do that. No, I appreciate the response. One of the question: uh, Are you assigned to n number of departments where we will be one of them? What's what is uh, your availability to us? Uh, my availability to so I'm an assistant county counsel. I oversee our um, our labor employment work for the county. Uh, as well as provide legal advice. I'm not assigned to any particular department, although I do provide advice to multiple departments as needs arise. Specifically getting to the basis for your question, as I understand it, if Jay calls me or the board president calls me or there's an urgent board issue, I'm gonna ensure that I provide you time and legal advice. In addition, the county counsel, James Williams, is working on assigning at a minimum of one additional deputy to uh, to the representation so that you'll get the same benefit that you've had for years with respect to uh, Dan and his firm and having a minimum of two folks that you can go to. Uh, to the extent that other issues arise within, our, within the county council's office, we have a little over 100 lawyers now. And so it would not be difficult to find somebody with, for whom there wasn't a conflict if we needed to on an assignment type basis or a specific need type basis, assign someone else uh, if there was a conflict. If there's no conflict, then obviously you've got the full weight of our entire office and on all of its attorneys with respect to legal questions that arise. Great. Thank you. I appreciate the answer. Great. Thanks, Roger. Any other questions from the commissioners? All right. Any questions at this time from the public? Uh, yes, Alan has a question. Go ahead, Alan. Thank you. Actually, I have a, quite a few questions. I don't know whether there'll be a chance to answer them, but um, the uh, management audit identified a number of things which the auditor claims were illegal. I'm curious whether the county, county uh, 
legal uh, counsel participated in those decisions and whether there'll be any subsequent uh, follow-up with regards to those matters. Secondly, um, I'm interested in finding out whether um, LAFCO has any, any role in the, um, in the uh, merger or dissolution, whatever you want to call it, of, of the district and whether it has to follow any type of LAP, LAPCO procedures. And then the last one has to do actually with the, with the uh, fire chief. The, the Board of Supervisors seem to treat the fire chief as if he's the fire chief for the county. But in actuality, he's only a fire chief for about 10 or 20% of the area of the county. And it's kind of confusing um, when I listen to the discussions because uh, they ask him questions uh, that, that have nothing to do with uh, his, area of, his area of responsibility. So maybe you could explain um, what the role of the uh, chief of Central Fire Protection District has with regards to the overall county uh, fire program. Thank you. If, uh, would the board like me to respond to the questions? Yes, please. Yeah. Sure, I'm happy to do that. I, I, you, I'm not, I, I, at the board's discretion, obviously, we can uh, respond to public comment and public questions, so I'm, I'm happy to do it. Um, on the, with respect to the first question, which as I understand it was, uh, was our office involved in the management audit uh, recommendations or, or, or legal analysis? I think I, the answer to that simply is, is no. Uh, the management auditor, uh, based on the report, recommended that a legal analysis be done by county council. Um, that uh, analysis will be done by uh, our office. Uh, the ad hoc subcommittee concurred in that recommendation to have county council uh, do that analysis. Um, and so that uh, analysis will be done. Um, but uh, if the question was, was it done in advance? The answer is no, the recommendation was in fact to do the analysis. With respect to the role yeah. of, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Rob. Sure. With respect to the role of 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 LAFCO, I can look specifically into that. I think it may depend on what occurs as to what LAFCO's role may be. Um, and at this point, there's no proposal on the table, as I understand it. Uh, although Supervisor Simidian did indicate there are two supervisors uh, who are interested in pursuing both the uh, revocation of the delegation as well as consolidation, but not even Supervisor Simidian is certain what that means and uh, indicated that we won't even know probably until the Wednesday before the October 6th uh, Board of Supervisors meeting uh, what is being proposed if we even know it then. So I, I can uh, do the a legal assessment as to what the LAFCO's role would be based on specific questions that are asked. I've not done that in preparation for today's meeting because again, there's nothing pending. With respect to the role of the fire chief um, and, and the, uh, the Board of Supervisors questions for the fire chief, I, I don't know what the rationale behind the board asking specific questions is of the fire chief. Um, I do know the fire chief is the chief of the Central Fire Protection District. And so uh, that is the, the, that chief's authority and um, to the extent the boards ask questions that go beyond that, um, there are probably any number of reasons they may do so, including they don't have other chiefs sitting before them able to answer questions to give them context and the way it deserves. But the reality of it is um, that would be a question that perhaps is best uh, addressed to Supervisor Simidian or the individual board members as to, um, as to the scope of the questions that, that they're asking the fire chief. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks. Rob. Any other questions from the public? All right. I'll now entertain a motion to adopt 20-29. Move adoption. This is Duffy speaking. Move adoption of resolution 2029. All right. Any just second, please. I see. Well, second. George second. All right. So the item is now open for discussion. Any further discussion from commissioners? I'd like to say Any, that this, this yeah. marks the uh, end of a uh, relationship that has been uh, a positive one for me with the fire district, with Mr. Siegel, uh, I guess I can say Dan. Uh, and uh, 
I, I hate to see this end with such ignominious situation, but uh, my thanks. Amidst my vote to sever this, um, it goes along with my thanks. All right. Roger, get in front of the skis. That's the next one we have to do. That's this next. is just adopting <laughs> County Council. But okay, anything else from the commissioners? Anything from the public? All right, District Clerk Vargas, please conduct a roll call vote. President Warren? Yes. Vice President Bond? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. Commissioner Spreen? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kearney? Yes. Okay, and the motion passes seven to zero. All right. Now we'll move to item 13, adoption, adoption of resolution 20-30, authorizing notice of termination of the agreement for legal services between Los Altos Hills County Fire District and Jurgen Siegel McClure and Flegel LLP. Uh, item 13A, resolution 20-30, um, authorizing uh, a resolution of Los Altos Hills County Fire District authorizing notice of ter to terminate the agreement for legal services between the, the Los Altos Hills County Fire District and Jorg Jorgensen, Siegel, McClure, Flagel, LLP. General Manager Logan, please present the item. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Um, the District Board of Commissioner approval of the exclusive use of County Council for legal services for the district will require notice and termination of the current agreement for legal services between the district and Jorgensen, Siegel, McClure, and Flagel. The process for termination of the agreement is set forth in paragraph 11, and that's attached to the, res to the res that was attached to, I think, a, one of the resolutions, uh, is the notice of termination of the agreement for legal services, effective five days after September 15th, or such earlier date after September 15th, to which Jorgensen, Siegel, McClure, and Flagel agrees. So the attachment to resolution 20.30 is uh, the letter of notice, is the notice of termination. Uh, end of my report, thank you. Thank you, Jay. All right, are there any clarifying questions from the commissioners? Any from the public? All right, um, I'll now entertain a motion for 20-30. Spreen moves uh, resolution 2030. A second, please. Vaughn, second. Vaughn, second. All right. The item is now open for discussion. Is there any uh, further discussion from the commissioners? I, I would say this is the time for me to say how much I've appreciated working with Dan, getting his guidance uh, uh, formally and informally at all hours of the day and night on very short notice. Always felt very confident. He's always looking out for the best interests of our district and did his best to be responsive and helpful. And go Bears. <laughs> Any further comments from the commissioners? Yes, this is Duffy. I just have to say that um, Dan has been fabulous and great to work with. And I owe a great deal to him for helping me uh, <laughs> when I first came aboard to be more respectful. And uh, as Joe says, uh, to be more peaches and cream. So thank you, Dan. It's been a joy working with you. Anything else from commissioners? I concur with the uh, same thoughts with George and Duffy. I really enjoyed working with uh, Dan as well. And um, you know, I'm hoping that this transition will be seamless and uh, we can get the you know, the kind of 24 hour responses uh, to our yeah. needs uh, as we've gotten in the past. And, you know, so that, that's been one, one of my biggest concerns here. But uh, um, so we'll try it out and see how it goes. It doesn't seem like we have much choice. So thank you, Dan. Any other commissioners? Well, with that, Dan, I, I, I'll make the comment. I, it's been, it's, in the last four years, it's been great working with you, getting to know you. Um, I really appreciate the absolute professionalism of you and your firm and the support it's given the district. Um, it has, um, it's been great working with you um, and wish you and your firm all the best moving forward in the future. 
Um, I'd, All like, right. uh, I'd like to make a comment uh, also, just um, to comment how much I've enjoyed working with Dan and Jen Byers, who's just been terrific to work with over my almost two years with the district. And just to say that we all wish you well in your endeavors and we thank you for your service. Thank you. Great. Any comments from the public? Mark, Rob Coelho here. Can I make a quick comment, please? Sure, thanks, Rob. I, I, one thing that I'd like all the commissioners to know, which will come as no surprise to any of you or any member of the public who's followed what's been happening with the district over many years that Dan and his firm has represented you is that both Dan and, and Jen um, Byers have been extremely cooperative, collaborative, and professional during the brief time that I've had the opportunity to learn more about the district, um, including, you know, multiple emails and phone calls to try to make sure the transition was going to be a smooth one for the district if the uh, if the resolutions today were were approved and so you know as somebody who's been practicing law for a long time in a small tight-knit legal community even though there's a lot of lawyers out there i can let you know there's uh um you know dan and his firm certainly have been a, a, as best i can tell uh based on my interactions a, a, a credit to you all and and sounds like the praise is is definitely well deserved based on the uh uh, comments tonight. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Thank President, you. Another comment. All uh, right. Mr. President, another comment, Jay Logan. Um, as we do with outgoing commissioners or um, consulting staff, um, District Clerk Vargas, do you want to mention what we have prepared to send over to Mr. Siegel and Jen Byers? Yes. Um, so um, as is normally tradition with, with those that leave us. Um, we have, uh, I've ordered uh, two um, paperweights, one for Dan and one for Jen, um, just to thank them for their years of service. Um, I was hoping to have those today, but um, our normal engraver due to COVID, they uh, have limited staff, so it's taking longer, um, but I will be happy to deliver that to the offices of uh, Jorgensen, Siegel, McClure, and Flagle um, once I receive those. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Jay. All right. With that, I think we need to move forward with a vote. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct a roll call vote. President Warren. Yes. Vice President Vaughn. Yes. Commissioner Tyson. Yes. Commissioner Price. Yes. Commissioner Spreen. Yes. Commissioner Carr. Yes. Commissioner Kearney. Yes. Okay, and the motion passes seven to zero. All right, thank you. All right, we'll now move to item 14, financial consultant report, which is, um, so for item 14A, fiscal year 2021-22, budget development and memorandum report, uh, fiscal consultant Vargas, please present the report. Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you, uh, President Warren. And uh, before you, you have uh, the memo report for um, the fiscal year 21 22 uh, budget development. I would like to note um, at the very top recommendation, um, we recommend to appoint an ad hoc budget subcommittee. Um, that is going to be revised. So if you could just uh, cross out ad hoc and call it a Brown Act standing budget subcommittee. And um, Basically, this is uh, same thing we did last year. We, we started implementing the, the budget uh, planning process earlier so that we're not uh, slammed with trying to decide uh, what our budget, our planning, our, our forecast of budget is in January. So um, I propose that uh, the commission um, appoint the, uh, the Brown Act Standing uh, Budget Subcommittee at tonight's meeting um, of Two or more, two commissioners um, is usually uh, the general recommendation, um, and it also includes General Manager Logan and myself. Um, and uh, any uh, sort of recommendation that I can give names to, I have enjoyed working very much with uh, Commissioner Spring and Commissioner Vaughn in the past. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, Commissioner Spring um, would accept such a nomination if if offered. <laughs> Great. Um, okay. Um, so 
So remember why we need to do this now. It's I know it's September, but between now and the oh, fact exactly. that we traditionally don't have a, a meeting in December, we've got October, November, and then January to get our budget house in order because we have to submit it in February to the county. So that's why instead of having a, um, for lack of a better term, a fire drill, in February, January, February, we want to start this process now. So let's move forward with appointing an ad hoc, a Brown, a Brown Act um, um, ad hoc budget committee uh, for fiscal year 2021, um, um, 22. Um, is there any discussion from the, co um, the commission on this item? We need to appoint the commission, uh, the subcommittee. Any comments from the commission? So we need we need two nominees. Um, so um, so we've got Roger's name has been has been floated. Melvin, are you willing to serve again on the budget commission or budget ad hoc subcommittee? Brown Act standing. <laughs> Brown Act standing budget subcommittee. <laughs> yes, I'll give it another shot. Thank you, Melvin. Appreciate it. Is there a third? We, we have room for a third. Going once, going twice. Okay. All right. Um, any other comments from the commissioners? Um, so that's item 2020. That's item 14A. Um, is there anything else we need to do on item 14A, Corey? Oh, well, this is 14B that we're on right now is the actual appointment. Of okay. Yeah. So um, I think that if we have sort of a general consensus from the commission to have um, Spreen and Vaughn, then I, I have a question. Is it too late for me to volunteer? Oh, absolutely, Janice. More the merrier. You okay. can be on the budget um, subcommittee too. Thank you. Okay. Thank so you got three, Corey. Sounds good. Great. And so then uh, next steps will will follow obviously offline with uh, with our subcommittee. Great. Thank you. Thank you guys for volunteering for the budget subcommittee. And All right. President, I just wanted to mention that again, yes, we're sir. recommending that the budget committee be appointed as a Brown Act committee. And that means the meeting right. will be agenda. It will be held by zoom. Public is invited. And um, this is a um, a recommendation going forward for this committee. So thank you for that. Okay. Thank you. And, and just a so, quick so, yeah, comment. Just, Sorry, Rob Coelho, uh, just a quick yeah, comment. Uh, since you're going to have a three person subcommittee that's going to be a Brown Act body, just a reminder to those three, um, you, mm -hmm. you can't uh, be conferring two of you at a time on the on the on the subcommittee related work uh, because it, it, if it's going to be a Brown Act body, we need to make sure we're complying with the Brown Act as it relates to notice meetings of the subcommittee. So if it's gonna be standing, it may be a little, well, it's definitely gonna be more formal than the, than the ad hoc subcommittee uh, in the past. Uh, just a reminder, and I'm happy to talk you through any issues that may arise, but uh, the well, good work is, that you do, we can This coordinate. is intriguing. Would it, since in the past we've had a two member ad hoc when this would now be a two, me, two or three member Brown Act standing committee, if it was two people, does that mean we could we could talk to each other on any you're saying if we have three even on, the, on this committee only two could speak to each in fact how does that work within the <laughs> scope of the uh of the charge of the committee mm -hmm. you you can't uh have a majority of the committee meet right. right the brown act requires that you have less than a majority meeting and so if you've got three members or two members well, if you've got three members, uh, uh, you have the same problem as if you have two members. You, you can't have two people meeting because that's a majority of your, your subcommittee. So um, it's possible to agendize meetings. You can all show up to the uh, publicly noticed meetings and have whatever discussions uh, that you want in compliance with the Brown Act. But the um, it, it eliminates sort of the informality of sort of a phone call in the evening between two members of the subcommittee, which may be the most efficient way to get things done. But if it's gonna be a standing uh, Brown Act body, uh, then there has to be Brown Act compliance as it relates to things within the scope. If you're talking about other issues that are not budget 
tied specifically, then obviously then two members could could certainly uh, communicate together. Right. So there's really operationally no difference between two and three, because either way, if it was two, I still couldn't talk to Melvin about this other than a, a public agendized meeting. This will, and same thing here, I can't speak to either of the others with three for the same reason. That's correct legally, yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that, Rob. All right. So that now takes us to, we'll now move on to item 14C, report on the general manager approval for professional services agreement between the Los Altos Hills County Fire District and O'Grady paving for, or adjustment of hydrant valve boxes and repainting covers between meetings. Financial consultant Vargas, please present the report. Yes, um, so as, as was discussed earlier, the town was doing its repaving project um, and uh, the general manager used her uh, in between uh, meeting uh, spending authorization and this uh, agreement, which is in your pact with O'Grady is not to exceed $8,450. Um, they identified 10 valves for sure that needed to be raised and a possible three more um, at a cost of $650 per valve. And I have not received the billing from O'Grady yet, so I do not know what the actual total is. And that's the end of my report on that. Thanks, Corey. Thank you. Is there any discussion from the commission? Is there any public comment on this item? All right, we'll now move to 14D, report on the general manager's approval for professional services agreement uh, between the Los Altos Hills County Fire District and Management Resources Group, MRG, for the successor strategic plan services between meetings. Financial co uh, consultant Vargas, please provide the report. Thank you, Mark. Now, you will recall at the last meeting, um, this was discussed um, to uh, um, work with MRG for the uh, strategic planning process. And so again, this is another in between meetings uh, agreement that uh, General Manager Logan signed with her authorization. This uh, agreement is not to exceed $5,000. And again, I have not received a bill yet. I don't know what the actual total is. Um, and I wanna just add for those two items, uh, C and D, the total did not exceed the general manager's uh, authorized, authorized spending limit of $15,000. And that's the end of my Great. report. Thanks, Corey. Thank you. Is there any discussion from the commission? Any public comment on this? All right. We'll now move to item 15, resolution um, resolution 20-30, resolution of Los Altos Hills County Fire District, authorizing execution of amendment number one to the professional services agreement between the Los Altos Hills County Fire District and um, I think this is a, there's a typo here. Um, management um, management resources group uh, for strategic planning services. All right, so we're on to 15A memorandum report and item 15B resolution 20-30 between the fire district and um, authorizing execution of amendment one for professional services agreement between Los Angeles Fire District and MRG for strategic planning services. General Manager Logan, please provide the report and present the resolution. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, phase one of the strategic planning process for a strategic successor strategic plan is completed. And Marcy Scott, who's a district consultant and facilitator, will provide a report and the next steps for phase two. So that's the end of my comments. Thank you. And I'd just thank you, uh, Marcy Scott, for staying aboard with us. And I'll turn the report over to you. Thank you, General Manager Logan and President Warren and members of the commission. I'm Marcy Scott with Municipal Resource Group here to speak to you about this item on the successor strategic plan. Um, I'll make just a couple of comments given the late hour. Um, the ad hoc subcommittee of the strategic plan, Commissioners Price, Spreen and Carr uh, went right to work and have prepared a commission process to prepare and adopt a successor strategic plan by November of this year. My role has been to facilitate two community meetings hosted by the ad hoc subcommittee in August and draft materials based on content discussed by the subcommittee 
which has informed tonight's proposal. Um, in summary, this evening, the subcommittee has provided initial proposed edits to the existing mission, values, and proposed goals in the memorandum report that is in your packet. The intent is to initiate thinking on these topics and to ask for any initial comments from any commissioners or the public. Um, additionally, the subcommittee proposes scheduling uh, one special commission meeting in October with the possibility of another. Uh, the commission would use these special meetings to discuss the draft document, take stakeholder and public comment, um, which builds upon the existing strategic plan and the work that has been accomplished to date. Uh, the subcommittee requests your authority to move forward as proposed. And again, in summary, what that would look like if, if the commission wishes to move forward at this point, um, I would draft um, and prepare a successor strategic plan for a review by the subcommittee, by the staff, and then send to the full commission before October 1st, which would be a special commission meeting to talk just about the successor strategic plan. At that meeting, then, the commission would confirm whether an additional special meeting is needed. Um, and then with further refinement, the final draft of the successor plan would be prepared for a review and a final adoption on November 17th at the regular meeting. So uh, that concludes my summary comments. I'm available for questions and I will turn this back to President Warren. Thank you, Marcy. Um, all right, um, are there any clarifying questions from the commission? All right. Um, any questions from the public? All right, I'll now entertain a motion for this is 20-30. I'll entertain a motion to, for 20-30. 31. 31. 31. 31, thank you. Green moves the motion. Thank you, Roger. I need a second, please. Nice little second. Thank you, George. All right, the item is now open for discussion. Is there any discussion from commissioners? All right, is there any public comment on this? Hearing none, we'll now move to a vote. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct the roll call vote. President Warren? Yes. Vice President Vaughn? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. Commissioner Spreen? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Commissioner Kearney? Um, Commissioner Kearney left the phone conference. He left, okay. So yeah, I think we've lost just six. All right, Commissioner Kearney is absent, so uh, the motion passes six to zero with one absent. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Corey. All right, we'll now move to item 16, consent calendar. Item 16A, approval of draft minutes of the July 28, 2020 regular meeting. 16B, receive period report number one for July 2020. And 16C, receive period report two, August 2020. Are there any comments from the staff on these items? I have no comment. Staff. All right. Hearing none, uh, would anyone like to pull any of the items from the consent calendar? Hearing none, is there any public comment on these items? All right. If there's no further discussion, we'll now move for a vote to adopt 16A, B, and C. Tyson, so moves. All right. Thank you, George. We need a second. Green seconds. Thank you, Roger. All right. District Clerk Vargas, please conduct the vote. Thank you. Commissioner Warren? Yes. Uh, Vice President Vaughn? Yes. Commissioner Tyson? Yes. Commissioner Price? Yes. Commissioner Screen? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. And Commissioner Kearney, I think, is still absent. So the motion passes six to zero with one absent. Great. Thank you. We will now move to item 17, receive disbursements. Item 17A, August 2020, and item 
uh, 17B, September 2020, financial consultant um, Vargas, please share the disbursements. Thank you. You have the disbursements in front of you and I have no additions. That's the end of my report. Thank you, Corey. Any comments from the commissions on this? Any comments from the public? All right, we'll now move on to item 18, the commission member reports. All right, do any of the commissioners have any reports to make this evening? All right, hearing none, we will move to item 19, which is adjournment. All, All right. right. We will. This concludes the September fifteenth, almost September sixteenth, um, uh, twenty twenty regular meeting of the Los Altos Hills County Fire District. The meeting is adjourned at ten thirty two p.m. The next regular meeting will take place via Zoom on October twentieth, twenty twenty, at seven p.m. Special projects, special project services consultant Hendricks. Please stop the recording. <laughs>